Thank you for the introduction, Keith. So uh, this is obviously a small group. Um, so my goal in this is to really make this an informal conversation. I've got a lot of structure with the slides. We'll go through a lot of content, but as we're going through, if you have questions or you know want to discuss certain points or whatever, uh, just throw the hand up and I'd like to keep it as informal of a conversation as possible. Uh, first thing I'd like to say is thank all of you for paying to come to this. Um, we're donating all of our uh, uh, aspects of that to Lee for the phenomenal job that they're doing in hosting this conference. So uh, I'm not being paid for this or anything else. We're trying to um, support our friends over there. And really when I put together, this is uh, like my third or fourth time giving this workshop. Um, but really what I wanted to do uh, when I put this together is I was getting a lot of questions about uh, how does one build soup to nuts, a uh, functioning biopharmaceutical laboratory, uh, whether you're an early stage startup company that's dealing with those sorts of issues, or as you, uh, there's a couple seats in back if you'd like, um, or if you're moving more towards a growth stage company where you have to overcome uh, challenges of scale, taking the company from 10 to 50 people or higher than that. Um, so what I've done with this presentation is really a look under the hood about what we do to organize and run i uh, from the stuff that entrepreneurs care about, like fundraising and that sort of thing, to uh, things that as operators of your own business you should be thinking about, um, you know, uh, corporate structuring and how do you organize that, quality assurance, particularly in a space like aging, which is very new and doesn't have the long time track record of some of the other fields that we work in, um, et cetera. So again, supposed to be a how-to uh, and really deep dive on these things, so feel free to ask questions if you want me to go into anything uh, in a bit more detail. Um, me in a nutshell, I like to think I'm reasonably qualified to talk about this because I've done it. Uh, so I'm founder and CEO at i Therapeutics. Uh, I started the company in 2013 as a living room laboratory when I was in medical school in Syracuse. And I've grown the company to over 50 employees now, um, all physical lab build out. So we're not a virtual company. We're not a software company. We're not an AI company. Uh, we're a brick and mortar facility. Uh, we raised over $16 million in 2018, a bunch of peer reviewed papers, our most recent recent one in cell, uh, various patents and that sort of thing. Um, and one of the things that I like about uh, kind of approaching uh, translational uh, drug development stuff is that I do have a PhD and an MBA, but I also was able to go to medical school for a couple years before dropping out to build the company. Um, so it's kind of interesting to see the business mindset and how we think about building a company when you're talking to the accountants and the lawyers versus when you're talking to the bench scientists versus talking to the clinicians. They all speak fundamentally fundamentally different languages, and I think the ability to communicate fluently in all those languages is really important. Um, yes, sir. So, curious about the i like the, the name, uh, could, you, could you help us understand where it is? Uh, yeah, so when we started the company, uh, our original programs were focused on uh, blood stem cell transplantation. Um, and uh, in uh, Greek, I believe also Roman mythology, uh, the gods didn't have blood as humans do. Uh, they had ichor or ichor, which is a golden substance that conveyed their longevity. Uh, so we chose that as a name for the company, and uh, that's where that comes from. Um, Financial disclosures, uh, obviously everything that I do is for profit, so uh, bear that in mind with the discussions. We've got a whole portfolio of companies, each focused on different translational programs for aging, um, and I have a financial interest in all of those. Um, so the outline of the talk, I want to start by discussing uh, kind of our big picture goal. What specifically did we want to do with i -Corps? What was it meant to accomplish? And then how did we structure the entity to accomplish that? We'll talk a little bit about quality initiatives because, again, that's a really important thing in this space. Um, we'll have uh, a 15, 20 minute break or so once food comes up. Um, and then in the second half, I'll be really diving into operations and how we structure everything uh, to organize 50 people, um, as well as other issues like fundraising um, that are worthwhile. Uh, I will say this will kind of be like a moving break. I have a slide for it, but if food's a little bit late or a little bit early, we can just stop whenever it happens to get here because I hate to stay, uh, stand in the way of people and their food. So um, building and structuring, uh, what is i designed to do? And when I thought about i what I really wanted to do is I wanted to build a brick and mortar pharmaceutical company uh, that was able to take really any idea that I had or any great idea that someone else had and have a pipeline where I could put those ideas in and have a whole 
pipeline run and have a drug that can go into people come out the other end. So what you'll see in the design of how we organize everything is we really wanted the company to be modular and flexible to accommodate very diverse research projects. And I do think uh, everyone that talks about businesses says, you know, understand your vision and your big picture and stuff. But I think that's really important, especially in something like the last, uh, life sciences, which is very capital intensive. Uh, you don't get multiple shots at setting up your company and doing the build out uh, correctly. So you have to make sure you know exactly what you want to do. Um, I, of course, started as a uh, student of this guy, Aubrey de Grey, uh, back in 2007, 2008, he published Ending Aging. Um, I was an undergrad at the time and thought this entire idea of going after age-related diseases uh, was really interesting. Um, and i was really set up to execute on the vision of Aubrey and Sen's Research Foundation. Um, I'm assuming most of this audience is familiar with his work, but just to recap, um, Aubrey in his book described aging as really a byproduct of metabolism, a byproduct of being alive. The idea being that as we live and exist, uh, metabolism lays down damage and it's not until damage reaches a critical threshold that pathology begins to emerge and we begin to experience uh, the phenotypes and hallmarks of aging. Uh, when I went to medical school, there were two camps in town about how we approach age-related disease. Um, Aubrey organize, organizes them by the gerontological approach and the geriatrics approach. The basis of gerontology being we want to interfere with uh, metabolism to prevent damage. And the idea with geriatrics being we want to prevent damage um, from driving pathology. Obviously, the problems uh, with this are probably known to you guys. If we're looking at interfering with metabolic pathways, the entire purpose of biological existence is to keep us in a certain type of equilibrium uh, with complex metabolic pathways that we don't fully understand. And the second you try to move the needle with respect to one of these components in the pathways, uh, that can have a lot of off-target effects and it makes it very difficult uh, to accomplish targeted intervention. Um, so not ideal for trying to go after pathways of aging. Uh, the geriatrics approach I like to think of as really symptom chasing. Um, so the analogy that I like to use is if you have a leaky roof, um, you know, you start getting drips in the ceiling and you can put your pots and pans around to collect the water. Uh, but before long, that's really unmanageable and you're not really going after the uh, problem, which is the leaky roof in the first place. So the whole premise of Aubrey and Sons Foundation was this maintenance approach, the idea that aging is driven by very specific types of molecular damage that accumulate over time and drive the, uh, the phenotypes of the pathology that we see. And if we periodically repair that damage, um, we never cross the threshold needed for pathology and we can pe uh, keep people alive longer and healthier, et cetera, et cetera. Now, one thing I'd like to point out on this that Aubrey doesn't really talk about ever in his talks, but is really important for drug development, is this in the context of dosing. So one of the huge issues that I see when we're treating age-related disease is that all of the therapies that we're using are chronic, right? Uh, if you're um, on any sort of statin for uh, high cholesterol or whatnot, uh, that's something that you're administered and you basically stay on that for life. Uh, and this is consistent with treatments for a variety of other age-related diseases. Likewise, uh, for those of you that follow you know, supplement or nutraceutical regimens and things like that, uh, so more of a gerontological-based approach, we're also looking at um, chronic administration over time. This is what's very significant about this damage repair approach, the idea that we're not going to be putting patients on these treatments uh, indefinitely. We're going to come in for short periods of treatment to remove the offending damage and then go away until it accumulates again. And so uh, seat in the back if you'd like. Um, and, and we can go from there. So when we're thinking about how we're designing programs for age-related disease, 
this completely changes what's acceptable for toxicology profiles, for your ADMAT, um, all of these things that we think about when we build out a, a whole program. It is completely different if we're talking about a lifelong treatment versus something that we're using intermittently. Um, so I think one of the things that this really drew me to and I began to appreciate in medical school is that intermittent dosing. And I think that as you guys are building your own programs, particularly if there are therapeutic modalities, um, understanding dosing regimens and trying to you know, let that inform your actual scientific trajectory is gonna be really important. Um, of course, Aubrey doesn't go into quite that much detail. On, yes, sir. Yeah, so this uh, intermittent dosing is quite interesting. So uh, I guess in the preclinical stage, do people do a lot of studies on, uh, you know, frequency of dosing and uh, magnitude of dose? And yeah, so I mean, the, one of the major things that you're trying to do in a preclinical setting is identify uh, tox you know, toxicity ceilings, so max tolerable dose and these sorts of things, but also the frequency of dosing and the level of dosing needed to hit your therapeutic effect. Um, and the idea is that those sorts of studies are going to inform uh, your clinical trials. Uh, one thing that I have seen with a lot of startups in the aging space, and we honestly start out the same way too, um, is very little attention is actually paid to the clinical program uh, because most of the people doing this early stage research are bench scientists that went to school to get a PhD and they're doing the really cool mechanistic stuff that is their focus area. They're not really having a dialogue with a CMO type of figure who's gonna be guiding the clinical program. Um, cellular senescence is a great example of this. Uh, a lot of you are probably familiar, the idea of selectively destroying senescent cells uh, as an anti-aging modality. Um, if I'm going to go after an indication that is systemic, that's going to have completely different admit properties, completely different toxicology thresholds, all of these sorts of things. Um, am I gonna do it for a short period of time to clear senescent cells and then not treat anymore? Or am I doing like a low dose in a more chronic sort of a way? And this is why you see companies like Unity, everyone's like, oh my God, they're curing aging and making senolytics, but what did they do? Their first indication is osteoarthritis, very localized location with very minimal systemic exposure. And even the stuff that they have coming on the back end of that age related macular degeneration, you're talking about an intravitreal injection, which again, isolated anatomical space that's not really going to lead to a lot of systemic exposure. So in their case, for a brand new pathway, a brand new class of drugs, they're keeping it very confined for the first few trials and then maybe explore something more systemic. Um, that's a group that paid attention to the conversation between the clinicians and that thinking and the development team that's working in the preclinical space. So, so the reason I was asking was in terms of the model organisms, you know, especially in the aging context, is it more prudent to look at drugs or compounds in late life and do intermittent studies after midlife or adult and all the way? Yeah, and, and, and it depends. And this is where you start getting into clinical, ish, uh, clinical questions like, you know, what's my prevalence? Uh, what are contraindications for other either diseases that my patients are going to have? Or uh, what sort of drugs are they going to be on for common age associated conditions? If I'm going to be treating just a geriatric population with my compounds, then I'm going to be a lot, you know, I'm going to be very worried if I have an adverse reaction with statins, for example, which are commonly prescribed versus if the only thing that's a contraindication is a rare orphan disease that virtually no one has, I'm a lot more comfortable with that. So all of this entire conversation needs to be part of you know, the, the translational uh, development plan and, and discussions around that. Um, so in Aubrey's case, uh, uh, he breaks down this uh, idea very simply though. Um, this isn't my car, unfortunately, I wish it were, but um, the idea that uh, vintage cars were never built to last, they were maintained to last, and in the same way that we're able to mm. restore and maintain vintage cars, perhaps we can do things with the body uh, exactly the same way, but by periodically removing damage. And his main thing uh, was that you don't necessarily need to understand the redox reactions leading to rust accumulation on a fender to sand it off and repaint it or to just replace the fender. So a lot of our ignorance about biology can potentially be sidestepped by having highly targeted um, uh, damage classes that we can go after. Early on, Aubrey proposed seven classes of damage, uh, NIA and a uh, group published in Cell in 2013, the hallmarks of aging, it's all basically the same stuff. 
Um, we're familiar in yellow with cancerous cells, so cells that accumulate uncontrollably in the body and uh, drive disease. Uh, mitochondrial mutations, so the DNA in the mitochondria is partially housed in the nucleus where it's reasonably well protected, but a lot of mitochondrial uh, genes are still in the mitochondria where they get a higher rate of mutation. Uh, death resistant cells, of course, senescent and developing senolytics has just exploded in the last couple of years uh, as a major anti-aging target. Um, extracellular matrix stiffening, so the accumulation of advanced glycation end products and so on. Extracellular aggregates, we're talking about atherosclero uh, atherosclerotic plaque and lesions in the Alzheimer's brain. And then intracellular aggregates, my favorite, age-related macular degeneration, which is one of our programs, uh, which is driven by lipofuscin accumulation in the back of the eye uh, in RPE cells. Um, and then cell loss, so that's into your stem cells and doing tissue transplants and so on. So why are we going through this entire overview of Aubrey's stuff? That's not the focus of the talk, but what I did want to point out is if the goal of the company, our vision for our company was to develop anti-aging drugs, we're not going to be able to go after each of these with a single magic bullet. So our vision was to create i as an engine that we could put all kinds of different programs in the front end and have all kinds of different programs, treatment modalities, et cetera, come out the back end and use a portfolio of different companies to target the various aspects of age-associated disease. So this is kind of the vision of what we wanted to do. Uh, this also gives us a lot of flexibility with establishing partnerships with different uh, entities um, because we're functioning kind of like a contract research organization with i uh, We're able to do a lot of the work for pennies on the dollar and the breadth of uh, capabilities that we have at the company are pretty substantive. So, you know, if you don't have uh, a $300,000 uh, in vivo imaging system, we have that. We can do that study for pennies and take, you know, compensation as equity or do a straight partnership. So it gives us a lot of flexibility uh, with deal structuring and allows us to leverage our capabilities to help out other startups. If you want to launch a startup and they need uh, your services, I can get in touch. Yeah, so we've, uh, so we have a few different ways that we can work with startup companies. Uh, we do have a, uh, um, an actual uh, funding vehicle called Grapeseed Bio, uh, where we either incubate companies, trade services for equity, uh, or provide outright funding, depending on the entity. So if it comes into our strategic focus areas, um, that's a possibility. Uh, we also, for more established companies, do straight partnerships, joint ventures, things like that. Um, so the nice thing is we're intentionally flexible because the needs of every program and every company are pretty diverse, so we want to be able to accommodate all of that diversity uh, in our deal structuring. So when we thought about how to go about actually building a company to uh, go after age-related diseases in the way that I've just outlined, uh, there's really two games in town. You guys are probably familiar with this. The first option is to do a strictly virtual company, uh, which is what most people go for. So the nice thing about a virtual company is you're not dealing with a lot of infrastructure and setup, so you have low fixed costs. That does come at the price of high variable costs, though. So if you're sourcing uh, through a contract research organization, organization or an academic partnership, a lot of your work. Academics uh, tend to go a little bit slower than industry, and uh, if you partner with traditional CROs, the cost is a lot higher than if you were to do the work yourself. So that's the trade-off, but low fixed cost is a nice thing. Um, you do have a small team, which allows you to be very narrowly focused on one very specific project, but if you're not doing the work yourself, there is a risk of loss of control. Um, sometimes. Uh, different techniques can be readily sourced to third parties. Sometimes, particularly in the aging space, we've come to appreciate that a lot of it can't be. Um, a, a lot of the uh, models are very new, they're very diverse, they need to be developed and validated, and if you just hand that off to anyone, there's a huge risk that it doesn't get done properly, or important things are observed that you don't see because you're not handling the raw data. And then, uh, obviously, with a virtual company, you're dealing with IP assets only because it's completely virtual. In contrast to a physical company, okay, we have high fixed costs because we're building physical you know, layouts for, for our laboratories, but if we keep a constant pipeline of projects coming in, we're able to drive down those variable costs, so the cost per project is a lot lower. 
Uh, you do have a larger team, which means you have different skill sets that you can bring to bear and it, because you're doing the work yourself. You have a high degree of control and then you have physical assets and IP assets, which as the company gets to more of a growth stage, uh, gives you some benefits. Uh, you can do debt financing and other sorts of things that are traditionally not um, available to early startups, particularly if they're um, a virtual company. So having physical assets can be helpful. Uh, if we look at the different stages of a drug discovery program, this is kind of high level, but we start with the discovery stage on the left. This is usually uh, funded by friends and family, early stage accelerators and angels, um, and you might be on the you know, zero to 500K, something like that. As we move into early expansion, we go into actual development um, where we're trying to move towards a clinical lead. Uh, that tends to be on the order of you know, maybe 500,000 to a few million or so. Uh, then we move into the more expensive rounds, IND and clinical, and then later clinical on the right. Um, the Valley of Death, uh, it seems to be, especially in the aging space, there's a lot of angels that are really excited to write checks uh, up to $500,000, and you get a few of them together, you can pretty easily close rounds on the order of a couple million. But making that transition, which we'll talk about in detail, from a really exciting early stage hyped program to adding a level of sophistication to appeal to um, traditional pharmaceutical investors uh, is a big challenge for a lot of companies in the space. And I'll discuss a little bit about how we've managed that uh, to avoid this valley of death. Now, if we look at who actually does the work for a program, uh, the way that I think about it is usually universities are kind of on the early stages of this. So most universities are focused on discovering new pathways, validating those pathways. Oh, here's this molecular mechanism. It drives this phenotype. Let's ch chase that down and really understand what messing with this mechanism does. So more early discovery, a little bit of early development. And then usually when you have a validated target and some molecule that goes after that validated target, then you're pushing the molecule into traditional contract research organizations uh, to do all of your um, iterative work. So medicinal chemistry programs, biophysical assays to iterate your compound to be a more potent lead, uh, as well as your admet properties uh, um, in vivo pharmacology and, and this sort of stuff. What we discovered, though, is that in the aging space specifically, and we don't see this as much in other sectors, but in the aging space uh, specifically, many of the targets that are being described are being described for the first time in the literature. <clears throat> so they haven't been around long enough. The models haven't been around long enough to be validated in the same way that some of, our, uh, s some of the molecular targets are in, uh, in other fields. So, when we wanted to set up i our goal was not just to be another Charles River that's gonna be able to do all of you know, your, your typical IND enabling studies, but we really wanted to also be experts at the very early stage discovery work so that we make sure that the pathways that we're going after are indeed valid targets. It is really easy to spend millions of dollars making a wonderful compound that binds a receptor of interest or disrupts a protein-protein interaction only to discover in late stage development that that pathway was artifactual because of some nuanced thing because cells are complicated. Um, so what we wanted to do was really validate all of the models that we're using. We wanted to validate all of the uh, targets that we're going after. And when we talk to a lot of uh, startup companies, the idea of validating their target is foreign to a lot of them. It's like, oh, we're going after this pathway. Why? Because some paper said that was a good pathway. Okay, if there's 50 papers from diverse labs all over the place, I might have some level of confidence in that being a valid target. But if one person published a new pathway once, it gets in nature or cell because it's a brand new thing, everyone's excited and no one's actually replicated anything, um, we need to apply a certain level of scrutiny uh, with that. So that's why we kind of try to span this whole, this whole um, uh, area. So uh, my value proposition for i was, uh, by conventional standards, uh, the world's dumbest value proposition. Uh, if you have a lot of money, the worst thing that you can possibly do to retain that money is invest in the life sciences, number one. Number two, if you're going to invest in the life sciences, you absolutely do not want to invest in therapeutics. You want to invest in diagnostics or med tech or medical devices or something like that. 
And if you absolutely insist on investing in therapeutics, you absolutely should go the virtual company route and not establish a brick and mortar facility for all the reasons that it makes sense not to do a brick and mortar facility. So my value proposition was I'm a life science startup doing therapeutics and I'm gonna do a brick and mortar facility and that seemed to make sense. Uh, the real reason that I did that, uh, in a previous life I worked at a stem cell therapy startup called Immune Path out in Silicon Valley. Um, and uh, we actually had a really awesome technology uh, generating myeloid progenitors out of pluripotent stem cells. And uh, the technology looked like it was gonna work really well, super promising. And we had a lapse in funding. And what happens, apparently landlords don't appreciate it if you can't pay rent. And so we had to liquidate the entire facility. We lost all of our equipment and we had to close down the company despite having a working technology and despite with a few more months, we probably could have raised some money around that. So when I started i -Corps, my goal was to own all aspects of the company. I wanted to own the building, I wanted to own the equipment, and I wanted to own all of the reagents and everything happening in the building so that if we ever had a lapse in funding, I wouldn't have to liquidate all of my stuff because as we go into the operations of how we set up the company, replicating this de novo is gonna require a lot of cash and a lot of time that pressing a pause button is a lot easier. So uh, that was one of the reasons that I chose to go brick and mortar. Which cost? Sorry? Which costs uh, a lot, I guess. Uh, not, a, not as much as you'd think. I'll discuss in a little bit, but our first, uh, our first laboratory, um, if we get too hot, let me know and we can open this back up, but they're uh, making a lot of noise out there. Um, our first build out we did for only a couple hundred thousand dollars and that got us a vivarium, full cell biology infrastructure um, and a decent amount of analytical equipment. So a um, million dollars is super comfortable, a couple hundred thousand you can do it. Uh, that was renting the uh, actual building. So this is one thing that we found being in central New York and Syracuse. Uh, Syracuse actually has a highly depressed real estate market, um, but uh, it's right next to a bunch of uh, different um, universities. So we have uh, five or six major universities, including a medical school uh, within 15 minutes. Cornell is 30, 40 minutes down the road from us. Um, so, but the entire place is super rural and very inexpensive. Why is location important? Why do you need to be near university? Uh, first of all, talent. So uh, we need to be able to have a constant supply of very high quality technicians, also a constant supply of very high quality postdocs um, to actually work in the lab. Uh, one of the things that's distinguishing for our company is because of the relationships we have with the universities, we actually have a PhD program now. Um, so we have graduate students that join our PhD program to learn how to build drug development companies. They get a PhD PhD in biochemistry and that doesn't really exist. The, the other thing is capital assets. Um, we use on a regular basis uh, uh, an 800 megahertz and 600 megahertz NMR at one of the local chemistry schools. That's millions of dollars for me to bring in house. I pay 20 bucks an hour to use it and because there's no other companies in our area, no one's using that equipment. So it was kind of a perfect storm for us to have access to some really crazy kit. Oh, it's a 10 minute drive. It, it, it could, yeah. I mean, a lot of the traditional thing, a lot of people will ship out samples to core facilities and then you get into all kinds of issues like how stable are your samples over time. Um, you know, if you're doing a basic PK study to look at your small molecule in, you know, blood over time, like how stable is it in that? And you have to do all kinds of extra okay, so work. Just, with, you know, yeah. Yeah. Um, so we found that uh, Syracuse, at least, was very, uh, very ideally suited for this. There's also an airport, which is helpful because you know investors don't like to drive five hours to meet with you, and it's nice to be able to fly to conferences like this and stuff. Although we did drive this time around. Um, so uh, what I'd like to do now is just kind of walk you through um, the different stages of how we physically built out the company, the cost structures associated with that to your question earlier. Um, so I, I started the company with a pretty modest amount of funding. I got a, a grant as a first year medical student. Um, it says 450, it was actually $540,000 from the Life Extension Foundation uh, to set up a physical company and do some work uh, with uh, blood stem cells. 
And uh, because I didn't have uh, really any other place to go and I wanted to be uh, completely off-site and autonomous, um, I set the company up in West Syracuse, uh, very strategically located between the Roslyn yeah. Gifford Zoo and Coleman's Irish Pub, which is where we had all of our business meetings. So um, excellent pubs over there. So that, that was my apartment. You can see the pile of pallets out in front. Um, some friends from medical school and I, I moved a lot of equipment back then, so I was a little bit more fit than I am now. Um, but we moved all of our equipment. We were able to pick it up uh, at auction, recertify a lot of the stuff. Um, take into account things like the awning over the top there. We cleared it by about half an inch, but whatever. Uh, but when push came to shove, we set up a pretty functioning laboratory inside of our living room. Um, a couple anecdotes for how you can keep costs down. Uh, one of the major expenses that I was really worried about was the cost of an autoclave, right? Um, you have institutional autoclaves, they're very expensive, and we use this for sterilizing media and instruments and so on. Interestingly, uh, grandma's pressure cup, uh, cookers up in the top left uh, combined with canning jars were perfectly fine for sterilizing media. Now, I see a couple of you are a little bit skeptical about that. Um, I was in medical school at the time, remember? So I went to the uh, room size autoclave that they had at the medical school and got all their protocols and the kits that they used to validate their autoclave and show that it was actually sterilizing the stuff. And I validated the pressure cookers using the exact same quality standards that the medical school used uh, for their equipment. So. Um, you know, very inexpensive way to acquire um, capabilities for, for uh, autoclaving. Um, I had a microplate reader on the computer over here. That one I was particularly uh, pleased with. I bought the microplate reader for $50 on eBay. The problem with a lot of used equipment is not the hardware, but the software. So where do you get software? I reached out to the company and they wanted $5,000 for the software, which I wasn't really prepared to pay. I did have a copy of the software, but I didn't have the serial number in order to activate it. So I did know that the serial number followed a very particular pattern of so many letters, so many numbers, and so many letters. So I punched that into Google as all random variables, and someone published in the Pakistani journal of something or other their serial number instead of the software version in a paper, and that got me a $50 microplate reader, which is pretty cool. Um, we also did, uh, I have a liquid handling robot down there, uh, early generation Biomech. Also uh, met the guy that uh, invented the Biomech uh, during his PhD work, really cool guy. Um, but uh, for the Biomac, we built a sterile facility. We used HEPA-grade um, Walmart air purifiers over here uh, to keep a positive pressure gradient in there when we finished building it. This was under construction, um, and we did sterility testing and so on to show that we could um, actually uh, do mammalian cell culture and things like that in that little contraption. Um, all this to say, you can get a lot of capabilities for very little money um, if you're willing to roll your sleeves up and try some things. Um, because we are academics at heart, not my greatest paper in my life, but we did publish a, uh, an automated stem cell differentiation protocol that we put on the $50 robot in the living room and that was published in a peer reviewed journal. Now, one of the things that we wanted to do because we were in the stem cell space was a little bit more intricate and that is we wanted to do xenograft models, meaning we wanted to be able to take our human cell products, inject them into mice and characterize them. And the problem with this is that to do that sort of work, you need to use immunocompromised mice. And the problem with immunocompromised mice is that you need to have a clean room in order to house them, otherwise they pick up opportunistic infections that you and I and normal mice uh, don't have any problem with. Uh, so we built that too. One of the uh, bedrooms in my three bedroom apartment, um, we sectioned off into three different rooms. We had uh, like a hallway where you could see in, we had a gown in room, uh, and then we had the room where we actually held the mice. Um, we uh, sealed the entire thing with this reflective uh, material that we were able to uh, bleach and we had germicidal UV lights uh, in order to uh, keep everything clean in there. Um, this is uh, showing from the outside in kind of the finished product. Again, Walmart grade HEPA air purifiers pushing air in via galvanized heating duct. And uh, that room previously served as a laundry room. So where the dryer exhausts outside of the building is what we use for a positive pressure blow off uh, for the pressurized animal room. Now again, 
ah, this is super sketchy. There's no way that you actually kept those mice clean. Um, my girlfriend, who was in veterinary school at Cornell at the time, the top uh, veterinary school, uh, I believe on the planet, certainly in the United States, um, she would hang out at their vivarium and then come over with, okay, they do this. They set up sentinel systems. They do qPCR in the water. They do this, this, and this for air testing, water testing, bedding testing, all of that. So everything that Cornell used to manage their multi-million dollar facility, we were doing at the level of the living room with our handful of mice in a bedroom uh, vivarium. And being good academics, we also published a paper on how to set all this stuff up if any of you guys are interested. So that's kind of how we got our start. And if any of you are at that stage of building out your company, please let me know. I have a lot of tips and tricks for how you can uh, put on a decent amount of kit for pennies on the dollar. Uh, you're not necessarily beholden to university core facilities or large companies. A lot of this stuff, a couple hundred thousand dollars, I would say, is what you would need to do uh, this kind of a build out. Uh, what was really uh, nice about this is uh, one of our early stage investors um, got plugged in with us. He was like, well, if you can do all of this and you're putting out peer reviewed papers and stuff in a living room with absolutely no funding, uh, what could you do if we actually gave you a proper war chest? Um, I'll skip my second, uh, basically the story of i is me taking a crappy building, renovating it into a lab, and then moving on to another crappy building and renovating it into a lab. So I'll skip a few of the intermediates uh, and jump right to our current facility, um, which is in Lafayette. Uh, this is much more akin to an appropriate commercial site. Um, we've got a bioprocessing team with a variety of bioreactors, uh, FPLC systems, and so forth. Uh, to manufacture proteins. So one of our core competencies is recombinant protein manufacturing. Really important for small molecule drug screening where you're developing biophysical assays to see not only for pathway validation, but also to see how your small molecule interacts with the targets and to do iterative work around those things. Um, also in the case of our macular degeneration program, our uh, active pharmaceutical ingredient is actually a protein. So we can also do everything from microbial expressions through uh, mammalian cells. Um, with, our, uh, uh, with our protein expression team. Um, variety of gel stations, uh, high throughput plate readers, uh, um, imaging systems to do uh, in incubator imaging and all that uh, for IC50 determinations. If you're looking at you know, a cancer program or a senescence program, you wanna look and see, can we selectively kill target cells over non-target cells and so on, uh, all the kit for that sort of work. Um, and our current vivarium has a capacity for about 2,000 animals. Um, we've got, we do a lot of lifespan studies for our clients. Um, so we've got a lot of uh, the standard behavioral assays, uh, grip strength, rotor rod, treadmill, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, we do have a full-time vet on staff and a pile of LVTs, so we can also do surgical models, um, clinical endpoints, and things like that. Um, and then actually scheduled to be uh, opened uh, at the end of this month is our new vivarium, which has been under construction for the last couple months. Uh, that'll add probably another thousand animals to the mouse rat capabilities that we have. Um, but it's also gonna allow us to do um, large animal, uh, everything but non-human primate. Uh, we're also putting on an in vivo imaging system with a radiator and um, uh, we're, our, our intent is to be able to do GLP, IND enabling GLP studies completely in house. So again, next steps towards putting on that complete pipeline of early discovery biophysical assays to doing everything through cells to moving for preliminary in vivo work and then large animal IND enabling stuff. Um, so this is effectively a vertically integrated pharmaceutical company that we're building. And again, our kind of core competencies are really on small molecule discovery, a lot of work with protein engineering. We do quite a bit with stem cell biology because that's the area that I really like. Um, obviously lab animal husbandry. And then uh, uh, in I guess late 2017, we were also really fortunate uh, to recruit a very high quality chief medical officer um, he did Remicade, it's a multi-billion dollar drug for uh, Johnson & Johnson, if you guys are familiar with it, but um, for perspective, uh, Unity posts on their website that their leadership team has something like 12 approved drugs between them. Um, our CMO has 11 by himself, so uh, that's kind of cool. Um, he doesn't do a lot of the preclinical stuff, but he's really been plugging in with us super early, again, to advise on what indications we should be looking at for the different programs because all of your preclinical work really should be focused on either 
identifying what the clinical indication is going to be or building towards a known clinical indication. So that dialogue has been super helpful uh, in helping to guide the company. Uh, we mostly focus in small molecule, but we, again, do some work with biologic stem cells and we do some educational grants with the PhD program and internships and that sort of thing. Um, so that's kind of a, a rundown of our trajectory going from you know, living room lab all the way through to building out proper facilities uh, and being able to uh, you know, put on actual capabilities. Um, any questions before I continue to the next section? I know we're dropping a lot of material here. Yes, sir. So um, in terms of the animal studies that you showed, um, if you have one, one small molecule, uh, how expensive is it to run uh, studies, eating studies on mouse? Uh, in your own facility? Yeah, sure. You know, you uh, so, so I built I, I built the vivarium for about three thousand uh, dollars plus labor, but we built it ourselves. Um, and then to do the uh, actual studies is just the cost of the mice. Um, on the regulatory side, uh, if you have public funding, then you're subject to PHS policy, so you need to um, you know register with the Fed and have an IA cook and all of that sort of stuff. But if you're only doing mouse work and you're privately funded, uh, there aren't federal regulations that we're aware of that govern the animal work. Um, most states you have to submit uh, just paperwork to them telling them that you're doing animal work, um, but there's not really anything that would prevent, if you're doing small scale studies like that, which is why we built this, um, there's not really anything that would prevent you from taking that in house. Versus if you pay you know, us now or any other CRO to run those studies for you, you know, you're gonna pay a decent amount for that just because of, you know, all that and, and again it depends if you're working on you know just a routine talk study that's very commoditized probably makes a great deal of sense to um, uh, to source that through a contract research organization that only you know that does a ton of that work uh, when we were in the living room um, the models that we were using were very nuanced. Uh, we were uh, studying how um, pluripotent stem cells differentiate um, through uh, development into hematopoietic stem cells. And so one of the assays that we were doing was actually taking a partially differentiated uh, pluripotent stem cell and injecting it in utero into developing pups to see if it would engraft. So we were doing in utero surgeries and injections yielding viable pups and then looking looking for engraftment in those. That's something that you're not going to readily source for any reasonable amount of money to a third party. So that's why we chose to bring that in-house. Other questions? Okay. So on the, yes, sir. On the chart there, 57% small molecules. Yeah. Can you help us understand why that's the driver right now? Um, our biggest program is a small molecule program. Um, I think that a lot of people are really excited about biologics because uh, it feels like they're smarter drugs. The idea that you know you can find you know a, a lot of the people that are coming over and funding uh, anti-aging work are of the mindset that biology is code. So they're really bullish on gene therapy. They like biologics, you know, protein to bind a receptor or something like that, um, and they feel that small molecules are really really dirty and aren't really any engineered to do anything specific. It's a big random screen and there's not a whole lot more thought that goes into it than that. Um, and I actually thought the same way when I came into the space, which is why I started with cell therapy. Um, but it, it turns out um, that's really not the case. Uh, biologics are great if you're looking at uh, interfering with specific surface proteins, but really anything intracellular requires small molecule. Um, I, to my knowledge, and I could be outdated on this, but a lot of people are excited about cell penetrating peptides and things like that. Uh, to my knowledge, there's not a single uh, cell penetrating peptide for uh, an, in, uh, an intracellular target uh, that's been approved by FDA, although I could be out of date on that, but I'm not aware of one. Um, so really, if you're looking at nuclear targets and most cytosolic targets, you're really looking at small molecule. Also, uh, as we've started to improve our biophysical and biochemistry chops, we've got synthetic chemists now, uh, biophysicists and so on. Um, I've personally come to really appreciate that 
we're very intentionally designing the small molecules we're looking at with uh, techniques like 3D NMR and STD NMR and molecular modeling exactly how the proteins are binding very specifically to the molecule to inform what functional groups we're building out and so on. Um, so we're able to achieve high level of target specificity um, with those small molecules and that's also what sophisticated pharma investors are used to seeing. Long-winded answer. Anything else? It's also the vast majority of successful powers are small molecules. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's not to say, again, that, you know, there's not a lot of opportunity for, you know, gene therapy, cell therapy, and other things. Just, you know, if you're... One central tenet uh, that I'll talk about a little bit in this at i is that uh, I really try to make one change at a time. I try to do one new thing and only one new thing. Uh, so our, for, for our macular degeneration program, it's an enzyme therapy that goes into target cells and removes lipofuscin. Uh, the program is designed in every single way as enzyme uh, replacement therapies have been developed by you know, Sanofi and Genzyme since the 80s. There's nothing different about our program except that we're using a non-human enzyme for the very first time. So one change. Uh, our cellular senescence program, these are new pathways, new target cells. We have no idea what that's gonna do to people um, if you go systemically and administer it that way. So I don't want to do a new pathway with a new target cell and a biologic that is unprecedented. So I want- One you thing you mean changing one variable. Yeah, yeah, one, one variable for any program that we do. Um, I wouldn't start, for example, with, uh, if I was doing a cell therapy, uh, I would choose, uh, I would attempt to choose a cell that is already known to work uh, for allogeneic transplants or autologous transplants and manufacture that cell from maybe a pluripotent stem cell source or something as an initial drug because then you're changing one thing, the source material, but everything else is kept the same. I'm not creative. Okay. Um, so in terms of uh, the actual structure, uh, one of the things when you guys are building out your companies that's a potential risk is hostile investors. Everything's going great when everyone's very excited about your company and you're doing all kinds of cool stuff uh, and then shit hits the fan and sometimes your investors are great to work with and sometimes they aren't. So back to my whole thesis that I never want to be without a lab and I'm one of those diehard, uh, diehard anti-aging people so I won't allow myself to be without a lab. Uh, I created a corporate structure that was really designed to leverage our capabilities but also make sure that I always completely controlled all of the aspects of the, uh, all of the physical assets for the company. So the model that we created uh, was kind of a, a hybrid model that I haven't really seen used before. Um, usually what would happen for a multi-program company like ours is i Therapeutics would exist as a holding company um, and then have a uh, variety of, welcome. Um, uh, yeah, there's a second seat behind you there. Yeah, great. Um, so what would normally happen is a company like i would exist as a holding company and each program would be a wholly or partially owned subsidiary underneath that and investment would usually come in at the level of the holding company, and if you did joint ventures or something, that would happen at the sub. Um, in our case, we structure a little bit differently. i itself, functionally, is a standalone company that isn't actually, from an equity perspective, involved in any of the portfolio whatsoever. So i does not own any of the portfolio companies. And what that allows us to do is a few things. One, um, i uh, we're actually moving all of our contract work to a separate company, Acaria Life Sciences, but initially i functioned as a contract research organization. So clients were able to give money to i to do work for hire, and then i would assign IP back to the clients. So very early on, we were revenue positive. Um, before I dropped out of medical school, we had raised over a million dollars, and over half of that was client revenue. So you know that helped us with a lot of different things. Um, but because we set i up as a CRO, the relationship between i and the portfolio companies was also the same. So investors were able to put money into the portfolio company of interest, and then the portfolio companies would contract i to do the work, and then i would assign IP back to the portfolio companies. And this is something that I found to be super helpful for us. Um, different investors have different focus areas. 
They have different stages in which they want to get involved in the company. And so if you try to do everything in one company, it's really difficult to uh, meet the needs of diverse investment groups. So our LysoClear program on top, for example, is a single asset play. It's one, um, you know, one, one lead series that we're developing for age-related macular degeneration, uh, and that is it. We're not doing anything else with that company that's highly focused. So the people that are interested in that tend to be people that are ophthalmology focused um, for development or might be interested in the biologics platform. Um, that's very different from, say, uh, entoxerine, uh, which is a small molecule screening platform where we can make very difficult to make proteins and go after new targets, where we're trying to do a lot of joint ventures with a lot of different groups and a lot of different targets. Um, so this really gave us a lot of flexibility for deal structuring. Uh, what this also allowed us to do, uh, so yeah, there's my slide for deal structuring. Uh, these are illustrative. We haven't actually done deals with Roche, Pfizer, or Thermo, but um, you know, the idea is that each of those companies can operate autonomously. Uh, a lot of investors also like this because one of the things that has recurringly come up when I've dealt with investors and when I've talked to uh, investors that we have longer relationships with is um, a lot of them get burned when the founder is not willing to let their baby go. So they get the founder that wants to stay on, wants to be in charge of everything. Um, I'm a preclinical guy. I haven't brought anything into the clinic yet. I haven't IPO'd a company, nor do I want to. And if we had a situation where one of our portfolio companies should pursue an IPO as an opportunity or something like that, our investors like to know that I'm willing to step down and let them put in the world leading expert and whatever the heck to make that deal happen. So this structure really allows me to, you know, I, I, they, they ask me, they're like, well, you know, how long are you planning to carry this for? And it's like, well, uh, I've got a powerhouse of a CMO, so we can take it all the way if we need to, but I will take it as far as we need to and not a step further. And I'm very open to turning it over because then I can focus my attentions on the next program in the pipeline. So having this sort of a corporate structure is really helpful for building in kind of deal flexibility and, and that sort of thing. Um, we also, through uh, Grapeseed Bio, as I mentioned, take some of our contract research revenues and we're able to use that to seed other entrepreneurs, again, either with in-kind services or direct cash investments. Um, and we can partner with our investor network. As we get bigger with a lot of the programs, investors that are you know, writing seed level checks might not be able to participate as much in clinical raises, but it's great if we're always finding new, exciting early stage programs and they're an angel that's interested in early stage programs. Programs, you know, we can syndicate with known trusted investors on a bunch of different deals, even if those companies aren't ours. So again, a lot of flexibility in the structure. Um, another thing that I did with the structure uh, is I kept all of the physical assets out, at least initially. We folded them back in over time. Uh, but when we started, I incorporated two additional entities. I had Kelsey Moody and Associates, because I'm very good at coming up with names, and i Laboratory Solutions, again, because I'm great at coming up with names. Uh, i -Corps Lab Solutions held all of the physical assets of the company, so all of the equipment, and uh, uh, KMA held all of my uh, all of the real estate. So functionally, the way this was structured is KMA had a building, i -Corps Therapeutics leased the building from me, and then i -Corps Therapeutics leased the equipment from the equipment holding company, and then i -Corps did work for the portfolio. And by structuring uh, the business in that way, we were able to make sure that the assets were kept completely out of i -Corps. And so at no point in time were the assets uh, at risk of being lost, whether the assets are the equipment or the building. Um, and even if we had a major lawsuit at the level of i -Corps itself, doing contract work for a client or something, um, you know, that's a shell entity that employs people, but you could easily re you know, replace that with a new entity if you really had to. Now, the question is, well, wait a second. You're telling me you're designing this corporate structure to pull all these physical assets out. Why on earth would your investors uh, allow you to do this and to use this as your corporate structure? Um, but this is actually a very investor-friendly structure, and I'll explain why. First of all, uh, because we have all of the assets and the building and everything else, uh, the investors don't have to carry that cost. So if you're starting a brand new company, 
and I'm an investor, I gotta pay for your startup, you probably don't have a team yet, you gotta do all the build out. All of those costs don't exist for the investor. Um, so we can get away, when we start a program, all of that money goes on directs for the project. We don't have any startup costs. We also don't have a startup time. So I've got teams in place that are readily able to be deployed on diverse projects. So we don't have a six or nine month lead time to ramp everything up and build out the teams. Uh, we're all set to go as soon as the money comes in and so we can move quite a bit quicker. Um, back a little bit too to the much less expensive, uh, Lab equipment really holds its value like milk. So, you know, if an investor comes in and gives me a million dollars and I spend $500,000 of that on equipment, if the company was forced to liquidate, they might get, you know, 25, 50 K out of that equipment. It's not going to be a lot. So we found at least with our investors, they like the idea of being able to do much smaller placements, have the money go exclusively on, you know, the programs themselves rather than capital build outs and stuff like that. And then have, you know, the benefits of a short startup time and that sort of thing. Um, and you'll see if you follow any of our press releases, uh, most of the rounds we raise are actually quite anemic um, compared to uh, what other companies raise for the same work and our investors appreciate that. Um, step, uh, stabilization as well, uh, certainly life sciences is a really volatile industry. Being able to have a contract research component where we can do work for hire isn't just helpful for deal structuring but also stabilizes the company. So if we do have gaps in funding uh, for one of our main programs, we still have revenue coming in that allows us to keep the doors open and keep everyone employed. Uh, certainly flexibility, investors are able to participate at the level of just what they're interested in. So the investors that are interested in everything that we're doing uh, do placements in all of the different or several of the different portfolio programs. Um, other times they're very focused on just we're really interested in this thing and that's it. And they can do placements just at the level of the program of interest. So it provides a lot of flexibility for the uh, investors as well. Um, and then uh, finally, there's a lot of tax planning that can come into this. Um, you know, we're, we're doing millions of dollars worth on the CRO front. Um, if we're able to, uh, with how we take in money from the portfolio company, uh, balance that with uh, CRO work, um, we're able to uh, basically have a burn rate that's equal to our, uh, the rate that income comes in. So we're able to actually bring in revenue, but not actually end up throwing a massive tax bill as a result of that. And certainly any, uh, any entity that has an investment placed into it directly, um, you know, that's a loss carry forward that you can use for uh, offsetting revenues. Um, so our investors at least seem very happy with this model. Um, and again, this really gave me a lot of flexibility to be able to isolate problem areas. Fortunately, all of our investors have actually been wonderful. Um, but if we had any irate investors, this would be a really, uh, you know, entrepreneur centric uh, structure to uh, protect there um, and also gives us a lot of flexibility with how we've been building out the business over time. Yes, sir. Yeah, how did you manage uh, the investor, I mean, in the, at the first place uh, for the uh, I for laboratories for managing the equipment and for Moody as uh, so what I did, and I did do this uh, very transparently with the investor's permission, um, but uh, for the initial build out that we did, um, the money came in and I loaned the money to uh, lab, uh, the lab equipment company, which then bought the equipment, and then i leased it uh, at a rate slightly higher than the loan repayment amount. So that's how we were able to push the money out and push the equipment out. Yes, sir. So on that uh, schematic which you had with i in the middle and other companies, so i owns equity or gives IP to this? Uh, uh, it depends on the company. Uh, i never owns equity in the portfolio. Um, so what we do, uh, if we have a new project that we want to start, um, we'll create a new entity. Uh, we mirror i uh, ownership structure into that entity when it's not worth anything. Uh, and then through i we either license in the relevant technology or if it's an idea stage thing that we don't have any IP to license in, then we just capitalize the idea stage company, that entity contracts with i and then the IP flows into the company as it pays i to do work. So are there licensing payments? 
Uh, previously, no. All of uh, all of the uh, work that we've done. So we've done some licensing deals with some university tech, um, but uh, historically um, we haven't generated IP until after the entity is formed and capitalized. So we usually do idea-based raises. Then once we have the funding, it's just a work-for-hire relationship. So there's no licensing. The IP just gets assigned in as the work is done. Uh, we do have a few programs now that we have enough revenue uh, coming in with our contract research organization. Um, i itself is self-funding some of our seed ideas um, rather than taking in a small seed round and have that dilution, which we don't want. For those projects, if any of this is early stage, we've only started doing this the last few months, um, but for those projects, uh, if they're successful, um, then we would uh, create a, uh, an IP holding company and then do a traditional licensing agreement of the technology out in a similar way to like a university licensing deal. Yes, sir. Yeah, since uh, 2013, how many rounds of funding have you had and what has been the pre-money valuation uh, it completely depends on the portfolio company. Um, the largest pre-money valuation we've had, um, uh, pre-money valuation we've had was 15 million, and the smallest was maybe a million five, something like that. Um, uh, we use a lot of different instruments for the really early stage stuff. A lot of times we'll do uh, just a convertible note um, for the later, as the programs progress, um, then we'll do uh, actual priced rounds. Um, we've also, it's also complicated, like in Toxerine uh, is a platform technology where we can drug different pathways. So we took a seed round into that company, built that up uh, to validate the platform, and then for one of the pathways did a joint venture um, um, which had a, a uh, we did a $10 million deal with Juvenescence for that. Um, so, but that was just one program of the company and we can go after others. So it really depends on the entity and the stage and so on. Have you ever used a safe? Uh, I haven't, but I'm very familiar with them. We just, we haven't done those sorts of seed rounds in a while and uh, it was still convertible notes were still more popular back then. One final question on the $16 million that you raised in 2018, mm -hmm. that was for ICO. No, those were across all of our uh, all of our companies. Okay. So there wasn't any set pre money for in, that was for the that was a total raise and you had multiple pre money value. Right, exactly right. Okay. Um, and one of the nice things too is our uh, our largest investor that kind of elevated me out of the living room uh, does do infrastructure placements with us. So uh, I was kind of joking. I had uh, an investor that wanted to know. Um, can I invest in i and what would the valuation be? And we had just gotten a non-dilutive $2 million infusion just to put on more, inf uh, more infrastructure for i from that lead investor. So I said, well, technically that's an unlimited valuation. So if you want to come in under those terms, we can do that, but um, not intending to be too cheeky. But um, yeah, so it really depends on the entity though. Um, but we try to keep everything happening at the level of the portfolio companies and for the investors as well. Uh, most of them, it wouldn't make sense to do anything in i anyways because i is never intended to be profitable and i is never intended to be sold or exit or anything like that. I, I core is never, I, all the money that comes in, we burn it on starting programs. So the programs that we're spinning out, the portfolio companies are intended to become profitable, be sold to big pharma, develop whatever, but i core itself isn't intended to ever do that. So it makes sense for investments to be taken at the level of the portfolio and not in i core itself. If, if it was a holding company, that'd be different. So for you personally, you take positions in these, uh, yep. the spin-offs. Right. And then the rate of dilution, the raises that we can get really depend on how good of a job we do on the research and with fundraising and all that stuff. You said the portfolio companies mimic the structure of i and Shelly, so is that, does that just mean that you have the two main shareholders and then you add in? Right, yeah, so we mirror, we mirror i uh, shareholders into the portfolio company and then we start taking in dilutive investment and y you know, you'll put in your employee option pools and you'll have uh, allocations for uh, you know, VIPs and K well, uh, what, KOLs that you want to bring in for advisory positions and stuff like that. So all of that is kind of reserved in the cap table. Um, but as far as like, we're concerned, we mirror over, then we start giving away based on all of that. 
Other questions? Great. Um, final thing I want to cover in this section, and then hopefully food will be here. If not, we can keep going, is this idea of uh, quality initiatives. Um, so, you know, I've talked a little bit, uh, a bit cheeky about how, you know, we started this company in the living room and we're doing all this crazy stuff, but um, we're actually really obsessed with quality at the company. That's why I validated the autoclaves. That's why we put in all the quality assurance programs for the vivarium, even at the level of the living room. And this is especially true in the aging space where a lot of the pathways that are described, the models that are described, et cetera, are very new. Uh, they haven't been tested by many different people in different contexts. And so combating irreproducibility uh, uh, for every company. Um, I'm sure most of you are familiar with the 2012 study by Amgen where they attempted to replicate something like 53 landmark cancer papers and the majority of them, 47, uh, they weren't able to uh, replicate and in many cases the lab that published uh, the results in the first place also uh, weren't even necessarily able to replicate their own findings. Um, so again, we believe that this problem of experimental irreproducibility um, is really exaggerated uh, and exacerbated in new fields like aging. So we have a variety of quality initiatives at our company uh, to try to prevent these issues and make sure that we have uh, reproducibility. Um, so when we think about uh, applying development efficiencies to a discovery workflow, it's really e uh, Easy is the wrong term, but um, if, you're do, if you're running a manufacturing workflow where you're doing the same thing over and over and over again, whether it's a highly commoditized uh, assay, you know, standard tox panel that you're running over and over and over again, it's, easy to, it's easier to create efficiencies in those workflows because they're not changing, they're the same. You can see where the inefficiencies are, you can see where the efficiencies are, and then you can iterate your workflows to accomplish that. Um, so, doing you know, Lean Six Sigma and, and, and that sort of stuff works really, really well at kind of this later stage stuff where it's a lot more commoditized. But in the early stage discovery where you're constantly doing completely unrelated different things, often with uh, completely different methodologies, um, how, how do you create a workflow that is as efficient as a manufacturing process when you're constantly changing everything you're doing? Uh, and that was the major challenge that we really focused on for the last several years uh, to try to overcome. What I have found just in my kind of anecdotal experience, and this is part of our cultural ethos at the company, is that most failures that happen in our workflows <clears throat> are a fault in process. They're not a fault of the team. And we can look at process by really being three different stages. You assign work to people, uh, they perform the work that's been assigned, and then the results are communicated back. So uh, whenever we have an issue, whether it's a mistake on a project or an error, those might, whatever, um, the question is, what was wrong with the process that led to the miscommunication or the lack of performance correctly on the task, et cetera? Was the person not trained correctly, uh, et cetera, et cetera? And which of these stages uh, did that occur in? Um, anyone that's worked in a regulated environment might be familiar with the CAPA system. This is used uh, regularly in GLP and GMP environments. Uh, the CA uh, of the CAPA stands for corrective action and the PA stands for uh, preventive action. Uh, these are two, everyone kind of views, oh, a problem occurs, we need to view this as whatever. Uh, these are two completely different processes with handling a problem. A mistake was made, a problem occurred. The corrective action is all about how can we mitigate the negative effects of that thing happening? Can we still salvage the project? Can we get useful data out of the experiment even if a mistake was made? And then the preventive action, which is a completely separate discussion, is how do we put systems in place to prevent that thing from happening again? So separate processes. So corrective action, what happened? How does what happened impact dependencies? So what's dependent on the results? Maybe you're making a protein. It's supposed to be an input material for something and a mistake was made there. How, what is dependent on that task that was done um, that's now potentially compromised? And then what we, can we do to minimize or mitigate those negative effects? And then preventive action, why was it able to happen in the first place? What was the problem in the system or in the process that allowed it to happen? How can we update or change the process to prevent that mistake from happening in the future? 
And then most importantly, quantitatively, how do we assess the effectiveness of the change that we made? Because it's really easy on paper to say, oh yeah, this thing happened, we're gonna use this solution, but how do we measure that over time and make sure that the mistake is actually eliminated and that the process is improved? So I've got two examples of this that I'm gonna share with you guys, just hypothetical uh, examples that we can talk through. Um, the first is the uh, case study of Bumbling Joe. Every once in a while we have interns that just don't do quite so well uh, and we usually name anecdotal stories after them. So Joe was one of our fun interns. Anyways, uh, Joe is a biotechnology technician and he's preparing ELISA microplates to measure serum IgM and IgG titers from C57 black six mice following injections of a foreign protein. So we're measuring immune response. Uh, while walking around a corner to the microplate reader with a stack of plates to analyze them, uh, he bumps into another employee and drops the plates. What should we do about this? First part is corrective action. So this thing happened, what's our first step? Punishment. Hmm? Punishment. Okay, so we're gonna fire Joe, so Joe's gone. Um, we could do that and that's actually yelling at the person or getting annoyed with them is very frequently how a lot of people respond to that. Um, I look at this and I say, this was management's fault for creating a process that did not allow good work to be performed. What can we, do? first of all, two separate things, right? Corrective action and preventive action. Preventive action, if Joe's an idiot, we can fire him. That's preventing it from happening in the future. Corrective action though, what can we do right now to resolve the situation or mitigate the adverse effects? I'm going to call on you because you keep giving me questions, so I'm going to ask you <laughs> questions. No, but first tell me the, how much damage has been done with the plates we have to look at. It. Okay, tell me more about that. So I guess all, all the samples are out of the plates, or how many are left? Or? Yes, yeah, so that's the question. We dropped the plates. Uh, did we have sealed lids on the plates, in which case the samples might still be there and we might still be able to read them? So that's kind of a damage assessment, part of the corrective action. Can we still read the plates? Uh, say that the samples are spilled all over the place and they're compromised. What's another question? You look very inquisitive. Yeah. Thoughts? Why are these taking the microplates from one place to another place? Why does he have to come apply the camera? Yeah, so that, that moves more into the preventative action. But yeah, why is he carrying a stack of plates? And why is he allowed to go around a blind corner with those stack of plates? Those are preventive action changes that we would do to prevent it in the future. How about corrective action though? We've got this catastrophe on our hands. This is a really important client and they're going to be pissed if we mess this up. And the samples are everywhere because we didn't have lids on the plates. Yeah, maybe, maybe, we have, uh, extra, maybe we have extra sample or we have a second set of plates or something that we can analyze. Uh, maybe we ran a bunch of different biomarkers and some of them are really priority biomarkers and others are less. So maybe we could ax the lower priority ones and still salvage the more important ones, right? So these are examples of kind of uh, corrective action. What do I have on here? Uh, yeah, so can the sample still be run to your, to your question? Um, is there residual sample that could be frozen or rerun at a later point? Um, and depending on the study, maybe the animals could have blood drawn again, even though they're only supposed to have it drawn um, the first time. So these are examples of corrective action. Um, in the case of preventive action, um, completely right. A blind corner is ridiculous. So can we put maybe a mirror on that? Or instead of uh, transporting the plates by hand, uh, we actually have push carts all throughout the lab and we have little sections where we have carrying plates and push carts to avoid exactly this sort of a problem where no one is walking around carrying stuff. They load up the cart and they push the cart and that prevents a lot of these sorts of collision errors. Um, my quality assurance director, I actually, uh, so he does uh, audits of every department on a weekly basis for me. And part of uh, one of the key performance indicators that he does for us is he will stand just in the lab in a particular department um, in uh, I think it's three minute increments and he'll just note how many opportunities for collision there actually are and we quantify collision opportunities. And that informs workflows of the lab. Uh, we have stairs that go from upstairs to downstairs. I made them double wide so people can pass rather than single wide, which is standard where people can collide. Um, best practices like covering plates with lids that seal before you transport them. Then if you spill them, it's not a big deal because everything's kept in the wells. Um, all of these sorts of things are things that we can do to improve the process, though we could always fire Joe as well. Sometimes that addresses the issue, sometimes not usually I find that it's a problem with process, not a problem with the person. 
did you fire Joe or not? <laughs> <laughs> no, I actually haven't. Uh, we, we uh, uh, sorry, internet's yelling at me. Um, we actually, um, I don't know that we've ever fired someone for making a mistake in the lab. Um, it is incredibly rare. We don't see employees willfully do something wrong. And part of our cultural ethos, which we'll talk a little bit about later, is um, I'm making bets eventually with patients' lives and certainly now with tens of millions of investor dollars. I do not give a crap about a $2,000 assay that got messed up. Is it annoying? Yes. The worst thing would be for Joe to collect those samples, run them, and push me data that isn't real or fabricate data or something like that. So the general rule at the company is, unless it is something incredibly egregious, usually safety related, um, you really can't get fired if you make a mistake, but lie to us about anything, however minor, and you're immediately gone. Because I need to know what the data is, if there's, oh, the machine's being a little finicky. I don't want you to just report the data. I want you to tell me, oh, this thing, you know, this uh, heater was five degrees off of where it was supposed to be, or, oh, I accidentally grabbed the wrong sample from the freezer and analyzed that. All of that information is the sort of transparency that you don't really get if you just source to a third party CRO, but we feel is really important for us to be aware of in house so we can make the best decisions with the information we have. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, so surveillance cameras are great. We have them all throughout our facility. Um, also, uh, for any of you that have worked in an academic lab before, uh, my favorite thing is so-and-so moved my stuff. <laughs> that disappears <laughs> when you have security cameras everywhere um, and people are very particular about taking care of their spaces and everything when you can just pull the tape. So uh, very good idea with that and we absolutely do that do, at our company. Do Sorry? Do people mind? I haven't actually pulled them, but I, it's standard. I mean, we, we also have a lot of controlled substances and stuff at the company, so um, it's best practices to have. How about the bundles? You haven't had to remove someone? Uh, I haven't. I don't think I've ever had to remove anyone for repetitive bundles. Uh, usually, if uh, there's a technique, if there's a technique that is consistently being performed incorrectly, that is almost always a result of inadequate training for that technique, it's rarely the person is deciding to be lazy or sloppy or something like that. No, for all of our employees. What's that? It's shocking how the firing Joe is so comfortable in the conversation to me. Like you recruited and you trained Joe, so my background would be if Joe said fire for the building, it would be your fault. Well, if Joe set fire to the building, that's a little different, yeah, yeah, but. I know, but I, I on that spectrum, um, Joe to be fired for dropping a plate is, is uh, you know, it's just a different perspective. I guess. Yeah, I, well, I wouldn't, uh, see, I no, wouldn't fire. I'm not doing that anyway, I'm just. Right. I'm just, yeah. Yeah. It's strange, yeah. I guess it's just a company ownership thing. I've had people who just kind of consistently underperform, so I have to let them go. So. Mm -hmm. Well, that's also, I should also take a step back and uh, we don't usually find that we have uh, significant issues with employee turnover, but part of the reason for that is uh, we're very aggressive with our recruiting. Um, I don't have any slides on uh, recruiting in here, unfortunately, but just a quick anecdote on that. Most of our technicians, we recruit out of our, uh, out of our uh, internship program. So uh, our technicians have usually worked with us for at least a year uh, during undergrad and they're fully trained before we decide to make them a job offer so they're pre-screened yeah, yeah. and and we are the ones well, that, that train them so that yeah so that that, that helps I out do, I do month trials and then I have to read people right and we do and also with uh, if we hire someone that has not worked with us previously it is exactly what you're describing uh, we pay them to come out for a cons as a consultant for yeah. a full week or a couple weeks and see if they fit or not and it is night and day difference and I don't even have to evaluate them. The team tells me, yeah, this person can hack it or no, right. they can't. Yeah, so you just put a filter. Yeah. Yep. 
Um, second case study uh, with uh, Saline Sam. So uh, Samantha is a veterinary technician uh, that's prepared a solution of new drug, our API for injection, but accidentally used a Hanks Balance Salt solution uh, instead of sterile, uh, sterile saline as the vehicle. Um, she injected the control group by tail vein injection with the saline, and then she realized that that's not the vehicle that she made her small molecule up with. So corrective action first. What should we do about this for a corrective action? Uh, can you tell me a little bit more about that? Um, so if they accidentally picked up the wrong solution, mm -hmm. and you look at maybe the label they're a bit too similar, which could have caused a mistake, or perhaps they were too close together, which means that um, maybe they... So that's an excellent example of, uh, of uh, preventative action. So the second part, how do we prevent this from happening in the future? Excellent example of that. But we have a crisis situation. Our control mice were given the wrong vehicle. How do we address this? First, to segregate those uh, mice that have been injected. And uh, then uh, look for whether uh, some more uh, control animals are there. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, maybe. Maybe we can do. Uh, maybe we have additional animals we can inject with the right stuff. Um, yeah. Can you make it into your control? Possibly. Yeah. So uh, depending on uh, what the new drug is, maybe it doesn't matter if it, if the vehicle is uh, uh, the uh, Hank solution or sterile saline. Maybe we have some extra drug left over and we can reformulate it um, so that the control matches appropriately. All are great examples of corrective action. Um, so yeah, is there enough new drug to remake the samples? Um, will the buffers uh, uh, differences impact the study? Um, and then can we do additional uh, injections maybe with different animal cohorts or so on to correct that? And then how about preventive action? Maybe we have an issue with the method or labeling, and so we need to make that a little bit different. One thing we love to do in the lab is color code everything. Uh, God bless you if you are the person that takes the purple pipette to the green pipetting station. Uh, that is the best way to uh, get in fights with lab mates. So uh, we do color code and use 5S for all of the different workstations. What else can we do with this for preventive action? Could even be as simple as a check. Maybe uh, you know, if you have very big or uh, multi-arm studies, is where we see a lot of these issues come in, or handoffs between departments. So biochemistry preps something, hands it to husbandry to inject. Um, so having uh, you know double checks uh, from from different people on the team um, is a really good thing that can, uh, that can be used for something like this. So all of these are examples of preventive action. Um, training, of course, uh, is Sam uh, even qualified to prepare the solution? Um, for some reason, I found that a lot of clinically minded people think that all of solutions are basically the same thing, but there is a difference uh, between you know, Hanks and sterile saline and other things, and sometimes those differences matter quite a bit. Um, how was the buffer specified in the protocol? So a lot of times in the study protocols that are informing how the work needs to be done, there's ambiguity, and ambiguity is the best source of mistakes. So was it specified what the vehicle is that the drug is supposed to be in, or did it just say administer this drug and not actually specify anything about the vehicle for it? Um, and then uh, certainly review the method to compare the desired uh, buffer versus uh, um, the recorded buffer. And with all of this stuff, documentation is really important because if mistakes are made but they're documented, you can still pull a lot of meaningful information out of the data. Um, and even if it's not a perfectly controlled experiment and it can't be published because you know maybe you mismatch the control, uh, the vehicle-only control with the vehicle used to formulate the API, they're sufficiently similar, you can make gambles on what the outcomes of that study would be and then reproduce it for quality later. But you can, you know, if the differences are documented, you can still make, uh, um, get information from those studies. Um, so uh, they said that food would be here at 1.30. I have timed this to 1.26. Uh, so what I think we'll do is uh, we'll take a short break Alrighty. So thank you uh, all for returning to part two. I appreciate that there wasn't a massive exodus of people at the halfway mark, which is always, you know, the, always the testament. But food helps keep people, which is. <laughs>
Um, so, so what I want to go through in this uh, next section, um, so I know I'm throwing a lot of stuff at you. That's the whole point of this uh, being kind of a workshop. And for those that want slides and stuff, I'm happy to uh, share those after. You can contact me offline. Um, for this second section, uh, I got some really good questions on the break about IP assignment. How do you keep separations uh, between the different companies in your portfolio as well as client companies, uh, fundraising, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so those are the sorts of topics that I'm really interested in covering in this section. And I want to revisit a little bit to that question that I posed earlier, which is if we're doing a workflow, if we're operating with a workflow that's constantly changing, like a discovery process where we're constantly doing different techniques, different assays, different targets, how do we streamline those processes and those workflows in the same sort of way that one would do um, for some sort of uh, manufacturing or uh, engineering floor? So we're going to touch on some of those issues uh, this section. And then the other thing that I really want to touch on this section um, is really the differences in uh, being a small early stage startup company with a very nimble team, less than 12, let's say, um, and then transitioning that to being a mature growth stage company where you're scaling up to 50, 100 people uh, and the nuances uh, with managing that growth over time, particularly in our industry where you might be dealing with hundreds of thousands or a million dollars and then all of a sudden you get a pile of cash and you're like, crap, what do I do with it? Um, so those issues I think are really important for us to discuss as well. So. Um, First thing I'd like to talk about is a little bit of how we've applied uh, Lean Six Sigma practices to the life sciences. Uh, for those of you that aren't familiar, um, Lean Six Sigma is a uh, really, uh, really common um, kind of ideology for uh, manufacturing floors. A lot of engineering firms use this uh, as a way of improving um, workflows and uh, optimizing for efficiency uh, within the programs. Uh, we actually did um, hire a uh, Lean Six Sigma uh, life science consultant to help us out with some of this. Uh, and then our uh, largest investor owns a very successful um, engineering company, so we've spent lots of time uh, on his floor talking with his middle management and really seeing, because they do a lot of research and development, but then also more like uh, manufacturing uh, sorts of processes. So we spent a lot of time with his team to really understand how we could borrow best practices and apply them to our workflows. Um, so this is something that I think is uh, rather unique to our organization. Uh, the first thing I can, uh, I'd like to talk about is a little bit about floor plans and how we organize the physical layout of the lab to accomplish different techniques. Um, in a previous life, uh, I was not an executive at a uh, fledgling startup company called i uh, I, in fact, worked at McDonald's. That was my high school job. <laughs> and um, I love McDonald's. Anyone that has uh, ever interacted with me knows that I love McDonald's. It was one of my favorite jobs. And the reason that I love McDonald's so much uh, is because they can take virtually anyone, virtually anywhere in the world, plug them into their system, and within four hours, that individual is putting out a reasonably consistent cheeseburger. And I just think that's amazing. And so uh, it's kind of funny, but when, when, when I started with i uh, one of our tasks was to take all of these complicated methods that we're putting on that takes a PhD to you know, develop and validate the first time. And these methods need to be reduced to a level that a reasonably intelligent high school student is capable of executing those methods. That's the burden of proof that we put for everything in the lab. A PhD is useless if they're the only one that can do the task. The goal is to institutionalize all knowledge so that we're constantly adding to the repertoire of what everyone at the company is able to do. But a lot of the process starts with simple floor layouts. Let's look at a McDonald's workflow. So, um, I feel very inspired by Journey. Anyways, um, so uh, a couple things uh, that I love about the uh, sandwich preparation line. So for those of you that didn't work at McDonald's, um, we, we start with the buns up top <clears throat> and we toast the buns. And then with the buns, we add all the different condiments and things like that, move it down the line, add our meat, wrap it up, and put it in the queue to be picked up and given to the customer. And uh, there's a lot of features here that we actually implement in our lab. Uh, first thing that I really like about McDonald's is it's A to B to C. So we're not doing a lot of like random crossing back and forth. It's a sequential process going from the start of the process to the end in physical space. That's one thing that's great about it. 
Um, a second thing that doesn't happen a lot in life science workflows until you get into more GMP, GLP type work is this idea of having specifications uh, for each step. So um, at each stage, uh, they have the bun toasting. How long should it take for the buns to be toasted? Um, how long are the buns allowed to be stored for at what temperature, so under what conditions? And all of this is validated by the corporation. Um, we have, uh, when we looked at engineering workflows, a lot of engineering technicians, uh, they would have a task they have to do, but they actually have to hit not only proficiency endpoints and the quality of executing the task, but also time endpoints to show that they're able to uh, meet time specifications as well. So depending on how over the top you want to get with this stuff, there's not just the quality, but also the time component as well. And that matters a lot if you're stacking multiple workflows. If I have a, uh, you know, a, an eight arm animal study that requires injections that are somewhat technical, uh, you get into issues like user fatigue over time and things like that. Um, you want to be able to measure that and have a clear understanding of how repetitive work influences quality and how much time your team should be able to complete tasks in. Um, another thing that they do is they avoid crossover. So again, it's going in line, but they're not bouncing around to different places, either in the walking or in the physical movement of the process. And then the other thing that they did that was great um, is they had an identical configuration on the opposite side. So if they wanted to double their throughput from a physical asset perspective, all they did is stick someone on the opposite side and they're able to run twice as quick. So very easily just plug someone in and they're able to scale up the uh, burger manufacturing. Um, the same thing can be done uh, in a uh, research lab. This is a, a publication, or a, a slide rather I pulled off of the internet, um, where they were talking about uh, creating spaghetti diagrams for optimizing uh, pathway mapping for, the, uh, for a given workflow. And uh, in this uh, pre-workflow, um, before, uh, when they did the spaghetti mapping, they see that people are moving all over the place for a lot of different, uh, for, you know, to get access to different equipment and, and, and that sort of thing. Um, and then what they did is they reconfigured the lab based on that information and created a process that was a lot more streamlined. Um, you don't feel this as much and you don't think about it when you're a startup company running five people, but my company's now at 50. And if I have a 15%, uh, uh, increase in the amount of walking that my employees are doing, um, that can add up to real dollars over time, especially as the company continues to get bigger and bigger and bigger. So there's a direct cost of labor with people just walking, number one. Two, if you're moving stuff all around like this, there's a lot of opportunity for crossing, collisions, things like that, um, that could compromise the quality of uh, your studies or uh, you know, be a source of errors that could, um, you know, cost you money, frankly. Um, so whenever we put on a new process, particularly if it's something large or complicated, uh, management will actually walk the workflows with the technicians and actually monitor what the handoffs look like, where the different samples and everything are specifically going to be placed. Um, we did a high throughput screen for one of our programs before I had the money for proper robotics uh, and proper label making and things like that. And so to uh, account for the fact that a lot of our process had to be analog and wasn't completely automated, um, we gridded out on a table where every single plate was gonna be gone, uh, was gonna be put, we had a camera set up so that we could take pictures of how uh, the plates were stacked so we had you know the the data all lined up correctly and then just with blank plates I spent three days training the technicians that were going to be running the high throughput screen with checklists and actually going through uh, dry runs of the process where they're physically moving the samples um, so that it was <clears throat> you know completely streamlined in that way um, so this is something that seems like not a huge deal um, but we found to have just profound found dividends in terms of the efficiencies of the lab and eliminating, again, like those collision errors and things like that. Um, a couple actionable tricks and tips that uh, I'd recommend from things that we've uh, found to work uh, effectively. One, everything in the lab when possible is on uh, wheels. 
So it uh, doesn't apply for some of your microscopes and analytical balances where it really needs to be a fixed table. But for most of your equipment, you can put them on wheels. We have a single power strip that everything plugs into. So if I want to move my six foot table with all the kit anywhere in the lab, I pull one plug out of the wall and I can move the thing wherever I need it. And I don't have to, you know, if you're messing with an HPLC, take it all apart and half move it onto carts and all of that. Um, I can just take the entire unit and wheel it around. Another thing that we do is uh, water, electric, and ethernet, we put in the ceiling. So for our lab, or I've seen labs do it in the floor as well, kind of like here. Um, the idea is that as we're changing workflows, uh, we might need different electrical loads. We might need different water um, as, you know, if we're doing some sort of, you know, protein expression, manufacturing, that sort of thing. So having just spools of cable and accessible water to tee off of and things like that in the ceiling, uh, you can really reconfigure your lab around whatever the work is, put the wheeled tables, move them around to the new configuration and tap into ceiling stuff and that eliminates most of your construction costs um, to, uh, to do that sort of work. Um, we also use crash carts. I mentioned earlier when we were talking about quality initiatives, uh, very rarely are people carrying plates or samples in the lab. We have bins that they put the samples in to go up and down the stairs. We have crash carts um, that are all gridded that they can put things on as they're moving them around the lab. Uh, that prevents, again, uh, drops and things resulting from collision errors. Uh, and all this stuff is really inexpensive to do. And I just, it, it sounds dumb, but this is like profoundly helpful to eliminate those sorts of errors. Um, I mentioned earlier also that we color code workstations and workstation equipment. Uh, that's a 5S practice. So uh, at a glance, you know exactly where all the equipment belongs. Again, you can see if the purple pipette is at the green station just by glancing at it. And this is also a really nice internal check for management too. As we're walking through the lab, everything should be where it should be. Um, it also makes it so your employees can find stuff a lot easier. If you have workstations that are configured in a similar way where all of the different um, uh, all of the different instrumentation is kind of organized in the same way then you're saving time because your team isn't spending as long looking for stuff they can find it easily and they can use it and you get faster uh, uh, faster performance as a result uh, and again walking the workflow with the team Anything that we do that's a new process that's more than just minorly complicated, um, we physically walk, we build out checklists, we figure out what the handoffs look like, and it's never a go do this, but we will physically map out the pathway, the, the walkthroughs and stuff for that to, to make sure that it's a seamless process, A to B to C, without uh, any crossover when possible. Um, in terms of... Uh, driving our efficiencies at the level of documentation. Um, so we, we, this is a slightly dated uh, org chart for the company, um, but basically what we did is we divided the company into people that plan work. These are our study directors and we have different people with different expertise in husbandry and cell biology and biophysics and so on that will design the actual research that we're gonna be doing. And then we have an army of technicians that actually do the work. So they're taking methods and they're executing the methods according to the study protocol. Um, the reality is no matter what your specific business and how you're doing your life science workflow, administration costs you money. And anyone that's been in academia really feels the burden of you know, getting approvals for animal studies or just writing out you know, the grant in the first place, tracking all the information, documenting everything in your lab notebooks. And God forbid when you're ready to publish and you have to get that grad student that's been gone for a few years and now we're trying to get their figure from 10 years ago or whatever, it, it, it's a process and the administration is, is always very challenging. Um, so what we've done is really focused on streamlining the administration because we felt that this is an area that really costs us the most money. And we've streamlined the administration in planning studies, uh, which we'll talk about a little bit. Um, we've streamlined the handoff from study directors to operations managers, so we have a nice pipeline. Work gets uh, designed at the level of a study protocol. It gets uh, administered to our department heads or operations managers that schedule everything. Um, and then um, how they execute the work and how that's reported back to the study directors and to management is all completely streamlined. And there's some very specific tools that I'll speak to uh, that I would encourage you guys to uh, look at that we found to be very helpful. 
Um, what we have done, just to give you an understanding, um, and a couple of you have uh, been to our lab to see this, but uh, when I am sitting at my desk in my office, within 30 seconds, I can tell you a timeline of every single one of the over 100 studies that are currently in the queue at the company down to the level of the task. So uh, technician A is injecting test article into these animals. That level resolution for every single project, uh, every study protocol that's in queue at the company. Um, I have, uh, we have in place, and we'll talk about the legal documentation structure in a little bit, but we have a research services agreement that governs the relationship between uh, i -Corps as a service provider and either our portfolio companies or our client. So all that kind of legal documentation I can find. Any study protocol, again, we run over 100 at any point in time, and for most clients and intramural programs, we've run you know, dozens and dozens. Uh, we can pull any study deviations that have uh, occurred in the course of completing any one of these particular studies, ongoing or past. I can pull any of the compiled data, so summary reports of finalized figures of where the projects are at any point in time. And I can go down to raw uh, notebook entries. Um, for one of our studies, we had um, an issue where we saw a very minor change in the amount of protein produced for a particular project. And uh, this is before we had these systems online. We were able to track down the lot number of the batch of LB that had come in from the manufacturer. And we identified that that lot number had changed when we saw a change in the protein uh, expression level. Levels. We were able to contact the manufacturer and they actually confirmed that they changed the recipe without changing the uh, SKU. So the catalog number was the same, but the recipe was different. We were able to pick that up because we set specifications for all the stuff that we're making and we were able to track down to that lot number and get all that sorted within an hour. And that was before we had these systems. Uh, we can uh, find notebook entries that have that kind of information, again, within about 30 seconds. On the accounting side, uh, we can see labor and direct costs of materials for any one of these projects, as well as invoices to our own portfolio companies and to clients. And all of this I can get to in about 30 seconds sitting at my desk with complete resolution um, just by having this well organized and using some of the tools that I'm about to describe. So, I know quality assurance and scheduling and project management is probably the most boring topic in the world, especially for life science people that like to nerd out about really cool biochemistry, but the amount of work we've been able to get done with these processes and the amount of control we've been able to have over that work um, has really paid dividends for our company and allowed it to scale and grow. So I'm gonna talk about that in, uh, in some level of detail here. So the, uh, and we'll dive into these a, a little bit more specifically, but the workflow summary of how we initiate work at the company, someone, either management, a client, or one of our study directors uh, will come up with an idea that we wanna build a study around, and we actually do planning. So this is where we're outlining or writing up the study protocol, so the work that's actually gonna be done uh, in support of the project. Um, one of the things that we found is really helpful in this process is to have a clean scope of work. Um, so if we're putting on a, if we're trying to express a new protein, we're not going to write a study protocol that says express this protein. We're going to write a study protocol that says uh, we're going to try to express this protein in this microbial strain and we will allocate up to four bioreactors worth under the scope of this study protocol. Because what we were identifying was happening is when we were vague about the scope, good scientists did good science. We tried four bioreactors on the protein uh, with uh, the C. coli strain, didn't work, so then we, did a, then we moved it over into insect cells, but at the same time we tried this other strain of E. coli and then we tried that. Uh, this kind of work, this didn't, so then we wanted to iterate the purification. All of a sudden, you get this massive scope creep and maybe management just wanted a can we do this easily or not? You know, it, it builds in by having very limited scope when you're running a larger organization. It builds in the ability to have stop checks on the work and it makes sure that your best people aren't spending their time working towards deliverables that actually aren't useful for the business endpoints of the company. So 
by limiting the scope in the study protocol, hey, you get four bioreactors to try this, then we're gonna reassess if we wanna put more resources into this problem or not. I have no doubt that anyone at i can accomplish any problem that exists, though it is a question of resources. So we need to make prudent business decisions and having a limited scope really, really helps with managing that. Um, we have uh, very clear uh, signing policies, so whatever departments are involved in the studies, uh, the operations managers of those departments need to sign off on the protocols, so that's a way of confirming that they're familiar with the project. Uh, and then we also have formal kickoff meetings where the teams will sit around and just, okay, you've all read the protocol, here's the high level summary of that, does anyone have any questions? And we're able to work pretty efficiently at kicking off interdisciplinary projects in that way. Um, with scheduling, uh, there's the handoff to the operations managers. We've got a bunch of tools we use for project scheduling and management, I'll discuss. One of the things that we got burned on repeatedly and we've now moved away from is this idea of doing new methods. Um, we're running a mouse study and we have this analytical technique that we want to use as one of the endpoints, but we don't need it for six months. So let's start the animal study and then we have six months to put on the method always failed for me. Never, ever, ever worked the way I wanted it to. So we have a very firm policy. If we're doing something new, the methods are completely online, as in full written method that's been run through by multiple technicians, trained to multiple technicians at a level that a reasonably intelligent high school student can run it. That is what it means to be online with specifications and usually some level of validation. And we do that for everything uh, before the study is even able to be scheduled in the first place because what you don't want to do is be playing catch up on method development when you need them for a study, especially client work. Execution, we actually do the study. Um, we have uh, basically no uh, paper notebooks in the company as far as uh, tracking data, everything is done. Uh, we, we started with Lab Folder as a software for that. We're moving over to Lab Guru, an alternate provider. Um, and we have very specific lists in the study protocol, as I'll point out, of study deliverables. Um, so it's very clear uh, what the um, team should be producing as they actually do work. Some clients just want a raw data dump and they want to do all of their own figures and everything, perfectly fine. Other people want a nice report that they can show to investors where we've done all that work to prevent scope creep and rework, having clear deliverables, really important. And then finally, close out, uh, we should be reconciling out the deliverables against what the protocol actually says that we need, um, and then having our quality assurance unit actually review to make sure we're doing all that. Um, so this is kind of the summary of how we do work at i -Corps. Yes, sir? Um, I wonder, I don't know if you mentioned it, but uh, how have you developed this workflow? Is it newer? How uh, by making a lot of mistakes, which is why I'm trying to share it with you guys. Um, yeah, uh, we are constantly iterating on this. We're constantly improving new things. And what we've come to appreciate is as we've gone from a five-person company in the living room uh, to a 12-person company in our second building to the 50-person company we are now, uh, the needs to do this well vary by the stage of the company. No, no, we, we, we drew a lot of inspiration by, again, Lean Six Sigma practices and uh, engineering floor, uh, floors for engineering companies that uh, we were able to do walkthroughs on and audits and really start understanding their processes. Um, in general, when you go to grad school, uh, I found at least they do a really good job of teaching you science. Um, they don't teach you a whole lot about finance for the most part, and they also don't really teach you a whole lot about process optimization because in academia, your research teams tend to be rather small. Um, so they're different skills, uh, whereas in engineering training, there seems to be a lot more focus on kind of that process optimization. Um, and so we found a lot of engineers have been super helpful in kind of helping us to customize those things to, to a life science workflow. Um, so to dive in just a little bit more uh, into the specifics, so looking at the planning stage, um, we have a, a legendary document called the study protocol, and there was a question earlier about how do you, if you have related entities or whatever, how do you ensure that there's an appropriate assignment of intellectual property for all the work that is done? So the way that we've accomplished this is we have what's called a research services agreement. This is a master agreement governing the relationship between uh, either the portfolio company or client and i -Corps. And so that document talks about all kinds of things, uh, you know, all the, all the legalese for governing that relationship. For the studies, our study protocols act as appendices that are legally binding documents for those agreements. 
So whatever deliverables are listed in the study protocol, those are the deliverables that are assigned to the client. So if there's specific data that we're generating, if there's specific physical material that we're generating, um, all of those kinds of components, uh, those, those, uh, the, those things get assigned to the client um, by way of this document. Um, <clears throat> importantly, a study protocol is not a specific method. So a study protocol might say, um, toxicity study, injecting this into mice, looking at these endpoints. A, the act of injecting, the technique of injecting, the uh, technique of formulating the API in a vehicle, um, the act of whatever the endpoints are, those are the methods. The study protocol will talk about the methods, but it doesn't address those specifically. So that's how we get program level assignment of IP, um, and the work that's done is assigned in that way. Uh, sometimes uh, there is work where, where a client might want us to put on um, one asset that's new uh, in the research services agreement we do have a clause that allows us to use non-proprietary techniques um, for different clients so if we go through and do a whole validation to put on a new injection technique for a client that might not be proprietary that's just something that we have to practice to a level of proficiency um, the, the document allows us to be able to use those services for a different client, whereas if we had a client that wanted us to put on a new diagnostic test, that would belong to them. That's not something that would go to um, anyone that we had on the client base. And those lines are drawn perfectly clear in the research services agreement and then also with the study protocols. It's also streamlines administration. Everyone's on the same page and we have a master document that we can always reconcile and know exactly what's supposed to be done for any project. Um, some of the parts of the uh, document that are worth pointing out, um, uh, let's see, the things I want to emphasize, uh, we do have a study timeline, uh, so this is just a nice kind of graphical snapshot, so we can really easily find information and have a very clear big picture idea in graphical format of what the study is. This is actually super useful, even more so for our intramural programs, because, all right, we do the study, we close it out, we've got this data package, and then six months I come back and I revisit that data set. You don't quite remember all the details of the study design maybe, so by having a nice kind of graphical summary, it brings you back to what you did pretty quickly, uh, and we can pull these materials and drop them in um, when we generate uh, reports and things like that. Um, we have a list of all the methods that are needed for the study that we already have online and ones that need to be developed, so the ones that need to be developed get developed before we actually schedule the thing. Uh, stats, of course, the deliverables section is the most important where we really specify all of the different things that we need to put together for the client and then ancillary finance things like budget, payment schedule, and so on. So that's how we handle the planning and we have a whole team of people that are trained to build these documents with the client and again we get signatures from us and the client so uh, there's IP assignment and this is the contractual agreement of the scope of work. Um, in terms of uh, scheduling, um, these are kind of our, our three go-tos with how we handle scheduling. Um, we want to be able to capture all techniques as institutional knowledge. So a PhD level person that knows things is not useful to my company. A PhD level person that can reduce it to an executable method and then cross train that to technicians is highly useful to my company. And so that's kind of how we approach all things that we do. We always want to be building institutional knowledge. Uh, we also want to build in key performance indices into methods to establish specifications. Um, so if we're doing you know, HPLC analysis, we're going to validate those methods at least at a research grade, if not under GMP. Uh, if we're doing productions in, say, a bioreactor of a target protein, we're going to be tracking what those yields are. Um, and after a period of time, we can set specifications for what the range of yields are should be for that protein. And if we see a really high yield or a really low yield, that tells us that something you know, funky might be going on. And we can look at that with uh, a little bit more skepticism. And then again, a method is only online when multiple people in the lab can execute the exact same thing with the same results. And again, the language we use with the company is a method is online when it can be executed by a reasonably intelligent high school technician. However, we have a lot of interns at our company. Most of them are phenomenal. I'd say the overwhelming majority are phenomenal, but every once in a while, every other year or so, we get that one intern that really just can't pipette anything. 
those are my favorite interns. And the reason for that is they are pro uh, process stress testers. So when we have those individuals, we take some of these methods, we give them to them, and uh, that's actually an incredibly useful intern process, uh, project is how robust is this process actually? If you have someone that you know, really struggles technically or whatever, uh, are they still able to execute that? That also points to where ambiguity is in the language that's communicated. If you're a biochemist, a lot of stuff in a biochemistry method is gonna be intuitive to you and doesn't need to be spelled out. So uh, we found that having very novice interns stress test some of our processes is an incredibly good way to add robustness. Where do you get it though? Is it literally just a Word document? Uh, so depends on the process. Uh, usually the way that we do it is um, they're given the method to read. Uh, the trainer will go through the method with them. Uh, there'll be a demonstration of how to actually do the method. Then they'll demonstrate to the trainer how to do the method. Um, and then the number of times that that happens will depend on how well we need the person trained. If it's a technician uh, that we're planning to have do the thing, um, then we're going to do really robust and build them up to a level that they can do that completely <laughs> autonomously. Um, if we uh, have somebody that we want to have, like we have a lot of people that shadow that we're not going to go through as much time to do complete training, but we want to expose them to a bunch of different things, um, then we might do something like that and give them a little, like an autonomous project um, that they can try out and see how they do with that and see how, you know, where they're at with understanding the method. Um, so it, it kind of depends on the, the person and what the thing is. Um, also depends on the complexity of the uh, technique. Um, if we're doing something like a serial dilution uh, and we're giving that to a high school student with coffee so that they can learn how to use the microplate reader, create graphs and understand uh, linearity in a data set, um, our interaction, the amount of training, etc., is probably going to be a little bit different uh, at that level than if I have a purification technician using my $100,000 FPLC. So it depends. Yes, yeah, so I'm just wondering, wondering how it's systematized. You know, so a lot of this sounds like you're a systematizing thing. Yes. And in terms of the training, how do you know which which version it is? I guess I'm saying like for for different study, study protocols, you said like right, this is the level of training. It's all documented. In yeah, yeah, all, yeah. All this is documented on the back end. Um, we're actually switching over to a uh, a new system now that's going to allow us to do this even better. That automatically tells us. Um, uh, Basically, what we're moving to now with the documentation um, is uh, for every technique that's done in the lab, uh, there has to be documented training on an annual basis in that technique to the level of proficiency established in that technique. Um, and then uh, we're going to be doing retesting every six months. So if, every, if anyone is out of spec at the six month mark, um, we can retrain them at that point rather than waiting all the way to the one year and we're still within the specifications we set for ourselves. It's uh, similar in the states to how uh, state troopers um, work for, their, uh, for uh, their shooting qualification. They only have to qualify every 12 months, but they test every six. So uh, if they're a tad under the qualification standard, then they can still be able to carry their firearm while they're getting retrained on that. Um, so that's how we handle that. So everything that we do when we put a method on, uh, there's actually writing the whole thing out and then as we perform the method, establishing specifications for the endpoints. Uh, this question here. Yeah, so in terms of the standard assays, uh, you know, I can see it's easy to implement all these procedures, but then early on you talked about aging studies in mouse, for example. Mm -hmm. So they're like replicates and reproducibility and uh, what kind of protocols do you guys use or to make sure those studies are repeatable and all of that? Yeah, so um, usually the, uh, the main thing that we want to see is reproducibility at the level of the method. Um, so what we might do, for example, say we're doing a lifespan study that involves uh, uh, grip strength tests with the animals. What we'll do is uh, within that strain, we'll grab a cohort of animals uh, and we'll look for differences at maybe a couple different um 
ages and we'll do measurements and we'll see at different ages how uh, males versus females compare and that sort of thing. From there you can determine what your effect size is and then, do, uh, and then statistically power that based on what endpoints you care about in the studies. Um, and that's kind of where you get into your primary endpoints that you really want to do all the powering around versus secondary endpoints where you might want to throw in to see if there's trends but those aren't the things that you're going to be hanging your hat on with a study um, and all of that kind of gets determined in those validations. Yes, so, so on that note, like in terms of in terms of biological replicates, right? On, on cell lines, they can do pre independent independent biological replicates. Mm -hmm. But then with mouse studies, lifelong, uh, what do you do? Do you again restart in the article study? So, uh, so, so, so it depends. So there's this idea, so validation of any method or any technique or any study um, can be done really at any level from no validation. I bought the kit from Abcam. I bought an ELISA from Abcam. I took my samples and I ran it with the control. There's no validation in that. Uh, all the way through um, you know, complete validation where you, uh, under like GMP, you would take that same assay, uh, you would have all the COAs for all the different reagents, you would confirm some of that independently in-house, you'd have multiple uh, staff members replicate the exact same thing within statistical parameters on multiple instruments, um, and there's a whole checklist of things you do for that kind of validation. Uh, so you can fall anywhere in that spectrum. Um, the challenge, as you're pointing out, is figuring out how much validation is appropriate for the question that you're asking. Um, so uh, things that we do uh, really depend on the program. If it's something, you know, if we're making a protein once, or just to see if we can make it a feasibility study, we will document what the purity is, what the yield is, all that stuff, so that if we want to validate that in the future, that data is there, it's accessible, it's easy to get. Um, but we might not actually go through and repeat it 10 times just to figure out what those specifications are. With other things like if we're manufacturing senescent cells for drug screening assays and we're characterizing the SAS profile, um, we're going to be quantifying that every single time with every single batch. And now all of a sudden we start to get a picture of under these manufacturing conditions, here's what this profile looks like. And you can figure out statistically you know, what the variance is there and you can, uh, you can uh, assign tolerances. So it really depends on what the method is, what the study is, and how much you care to have it validated. In my opinion, um, sometimes it makes sense to do very little validation. Uh, sometimes it makes sense to do more. I always err on the side of more. And the most important thing to me is I want to know how much validation was done. So if I have a study done with very little validation because it's an underfunded project or because whatever reason, maybe we want to get to an endpoint quicker, um, that's fine. I just take the validation into consideration when I weight the uh, data that's coming out of the protocol, if that makes sense. Yes, sir. We can do both. So we do have, um, uh, when we do uh, client work, we kind of break it out into three different things. Uh, we have straight consulting. So if you don't know what you want or you want us to weigh in on things in any way, we do run-of-the-mill consulting. And the rate depends on whether you're talking to you know, me versus a research scientist at the company or whomever. Um, we have uh, custom work, so if you want us to develop a new method or put on a new model, um, that's priced as like a full-time equivalent plus material cost uh, costing model because those can be difficult to predict how long it'll take to put the thing on. And then for stuff that we've done before, we do fixed cost, uh, fixed project pricing because we know, you know, there are, it's all online. We know exactly what the cost is, and so we know exactly what to bill for it. Sorry, a little deeper than some of you might want to have gone, but um, all this stuff I think is really important. Um, another thing that we do is scheduling an organization. So back to my favorite McDonald's analogy, uh, what do they have? They have, uh, they have uh, monitors everywhere. You can see how long the, um, how long the uh, order has been in queue for, uh, which orders are in the queue after that, and so on. And so we have uh, TVs all throughout our laboratory um, at, in, in every department that shows all of the work that's ongoing for that department. 
So all of the people on the team can just look at it and understand exactly what the projects are. If they get done their stuff early, they have an idea of where they can help out with other people's workflows. Um, and the way that we kind of organize the department is uh, the department head will do a short 10 or 15 minute rounds at the beginning of the day. Hey, here's what everyone's doing. Do you have questions, blah, blah, blah. Then people are assigned and using the software, we're able to do task assignment um, to employees and we can also do resource management at the level of assigning equipment as well. Um, one of the main software packages we've historically used for that is uh, Monday.com. This is really flexible and used for a lot of project management things. Um, Monday works pretty well. What I don't like about it is that their CEO hates Gantt charts. And so uh, the software is really rough for mapping dependencies. Um, most of our departments are moving over to a different software package called Team Gantt, um, which I am personally in love with. Um, the reason that I like Team Gantt is we've got, um, each of these is an individual study protocol uh, that was performed at the company. And you can click on any of those and see a Gantt chart for the entire project from initiation to completion when everything should be done, who's been assigned for things, what equipment is assigned for each task. So as uh, operational level, a technician or a uh, manager, you can see all of that. The technicians have a little checklist of their tasks for each day. But as a manager, um, I can do uh, project health reports where I can see uh, graphically where all the projects are. So I know just by glancing, I, don't, I shouldn't have to worry about these at all. These are all on schedule. Uh, whereas this guy looks like there's a few delays in there, so I should maybe have a chat about that. And I can click on that and see where the delays are uh, and see if they're real delays, someone didn't update it, whatever. Um, so being able to have that level of resolution for you know, over 100 different study protocols that are in process at the company at any point in time um, is super useful. And what it does is it also saves management time. I don't have to go through and look at every single project individually. I'm getting data as the projects are done, but just at a glance I can look for red spots and that helps focus my attention to the areas that it's most necessary. Um, so those are some of the tools that we use for uh, scheduling and project management. Uh, in terms of actual execution of the studies, um, <clears throat> uh, we do, uh, again, everything with electronic notebooks rather than paper notebooks. Uh, so again, I can find stuff really, really quickly within our system. Um, we do have a, culp a couple cultural things that we focus on that I think have helped our technicians become really strong. Uh, one is uh, management really focuses on the little things, and if you do that, we found that the big things uh, take care of themselves. Do not be the technician in our lab that spills an Eppendorf tube on the floor and doesn't pick it up, or let some pipette tips fall on the floor and doesn't pick them up. But when you have that really critical sample that you're not carrying, you're putting in your bin, and whatever happens and that gets spilled in some way, we're not going to chew you out for that because those problems tend not to creep up when you're focused on all of the little things, clean lab stations, uh, good workflows, and these sorts of things. <clears throat> One of the things I tell everyone in the lab, there are three activities that a scientist or a technician can do. Uh, they can make decisions, uh, they can pay attention, or they can do work. But they can only do two of those things at once. Two. Two. One. Not one, two. So, not three. <laughs> definitely not, definitely not three. And so what I mean by this is uh, what we see, especially with some of the junior scientists, is They'll start a study, pro they'll think up their study protocol and then they'll go to execute it. And something unexpected is going to happen. So then ad hoc, they try to change the study protocol with a deviation to reflect the weird thing that popped up that they weren't expecting. And then what that turns into is a bunch of unusable data. So we write the project and then you execute it exactly as it's written and you pay attention, so you're looking, you know, you're running your sample on the HPLC, you're looking at your chromatograph. Ah, is the baseline rising? Is that suggestive of something interesting that we should be paying attention to? Oh, this thing is supposed to be clear, it's actually got little aggregates in the sample, what's going on with that? Um, these sorts of things are really important to train into the technicians because they can tell if they're instructed to look for it when things look a little bit off and that can be uh, super useful. Um, and then the other thing that we train is if it's not recorded, it didn't happen. Uh, so this idea of documenting things after the fact is not acceptable. Um, 
everything gets documented as it happens. And when we go through the lab, anyone that's doing work, I can say, where are you? They can show me the method, what step they're on, and how they're executing that method uh, when they're doing work. So that makes sure that we're not having recall bias when we're uh, looking at documentation about what was actually performed. Um, and again, Lab Folder is the software that we use uh, for, lab, uh, for uh, documentation, and we're moving over to a different software, Lab Guru, currently. Um, these things, in my mind, I, uh, Microsoft drives me nuts. In my mind, they did uh, three things right in their lives, uh, Windows 98, Xbox, and now the uh, Surface Pro. Um, so this thing uh, is what we use ubiquitously in the lab. Every single employee gets one. Um, I love them to death. It's a combination tablet, laptop, desktop. So uh, you can write on the screen, you can pull off the keyboard and it acts as a tablet. Uh, they've got really great cases. You can drop it on the floor and it's perfectly fine. And with the docking station, uh, it can support up to triple monitor. So if you have people that are doing data analysis, uh, they can spread out. Um, so these are awesome because you can go into the lab, be documenting everything as you go. If you want to write it in the, into the software, you can. If you want to type it, that's fine. Then you go back to your desk with the same instrument, plug in the docking station, you got multi-monitor for data analysis, graph compiling, stuff like that. Um, and they've just been super useful in streamlining our, uh, uh, streamlining our documentation processes. Um, another thing that uh, this helps out with is there's not a lot of syncing. Um, so we do have all the, docu uh, all the materials put to a server, but you're not uploading it and downloading it. You know, you're not uploading it with a tablet or instrument from the lab and then downloading it with a computer to analyze the data and then moving things on flash drive. It streamlines a lot of that. And the most important thing is mini display port that you can plug into. So every manager has a giant television in their desk with uh, an open port. And uh, every technician, scientist, whatever, if they get a study done or have completed a project, they come in, plug into that, and we're looking at the actual data in front of us, not their recollection of data. Um, people are not allowed to come into uh, the management's offices and talk about data. It has to be on the screen so we can see it uh, and just the process of being able to plug a computer in in 10 seconds and have everything displayed that you can go through versus the complicated chain of emailing PowerPoints and stuff. Um, it just streamlines communication a great deal, a lot more than I really appreciated when we first started doing this. Uh, and then finally for the closeout, um, we want to be able to uh, get information about our productivity as quickly as possible. Um, Lab Folder uh, is really nice because all the raw data is on a central server, but they do have great export features. So if you want a data dump for a client that wants to have every, you know, all of the documentation, uh, it's there. Um, for one of the deals that we did, uh, I was asked, so I had put together the key diligence slides. There are about 12 of them um, for uh, one of our programs. And uh, the investor asked me, can you provide me with the raw data under this? Uh, and it took us about eight minutes to uh, export over 10,000 pages of every documented note from our technicians from, you know, okay, we made the LB broth in this sort of way to make the protein that was used in this biophysical assay, which was the input for this other, like all of that 10,000 pages worth in eight minutes. Um, so really being able to get to that level of resolution and export that to clients very quickly is super helpful. Um, we also, on the finance side, uh, we use a plugin called T-Sheets. Uh, this is really great because when we put all these study protocols and projects in QuickBooks, we're able to have us, uh, employees actually assign their hours to projects. So we're re really able to see um, how much time employees are spending on each of the projects that uh, they're working on. Um, and that obviously helps with you know, financial accounting and seeing what did our projects actually cost? Did it take a lot more, a lot less labor than we expected and so forth? Um, <clears throat> a couple, uh, couple comments on programs versus companies. One of the criticisms that I did get from some investors, particularly in the tech sector, uh, was this idea of, are you distracted if you have all these different programs that you're running in parallel? Um, and I think that there's a difference between being distracted and being efficient. Um, when I think about the, works, uh, the workflow of a new company or a new program, uh, basically, we get funding in for the project. There's a lag time when we scale, we're buying all the genes for the proteins we're expressing or we're doing you know, whatever to scale and prepare to do that project. In our case, we think this is a lot lower than traditional companies, but it still exists. Then we have some period of time when we're actually doing work 
And then we have our period of time where we're fundraising or preparing fundraising materials. And really for us, what we've been able to do by having a multi-program approach is we're basically constantly working and we're able to streamline all of this because as one company is getting ready to fundraise, we have others that are doing work and then when that round closes, you know, it's kind of like a waveform. And the same thing applies in the departments. We start with you know, chemistry and biochemistry techniques, then we move into cell biology to validate targets and look at biological models, then we move into animal models Models. And so uh, the programs kind of go through the departments in the same sort of way. So if you have this kind of organization and scheduling, you can stack many, many programs of, uh, you know, very diverse programs even, and have them kind of flow through um, in this sort of a way. Uh, so this is, um, you know, kind of how we've at a high level uh, conceptualized the different programs. Um, I do think that this idea of dilution of focus um, is a little bit of a uh, uh, remnant from when you know, a lot of uh, young kids were starting software companies and so forth and you know, you're giving an 18 or a 22 year old a bunch of money and they would go all over the place and do all these different projects with it and you really wanted them to be focused on the business. Um, I do believe that younger people can have a dilution of focus um, but adults should not. And one of my favorite stories, and I can't share the identities because it's confidential, but uh, I was at a conference, an aging conference, and I had an investor come up to me and was talking to me about i and all this other stuff, and I was chatting with him, and uh, didn't like my model because I was too unfocused in the different programs that we had, because we had several different diverse programs, and I just thought that that was a huge issue. And then he was telling me about these great companies in his portfolio that he was funding and how wonderful they were all doing um, and how, you know, if I was just stay focused on the one thing and be lean like those companies, um, you know, he'd be a lot more interested in us. What I couldn't tell him for confidentiality reasons was I was doing all of the work for his entire portfolio. <laughs> and and they, were, they were contracting like, virtually all of the all of the projects that they're working on to our company and we're actually doing all of the work um, so even though he perceived them as being super lean and focused and us being diluted we were actually generating all that data he was super excited about so um, I do think that you know this room isn't a group of 18 year olds trying to do tech companies uh, you guys all have you know backgrounds that are well beyond that and I think that uh, you know, being able to stack multiple programs is strategically valuable in the life sciences and a great way to leverage whatever capabilities you have. Um, two sections left, how to fund your venture and then a couple closing comments and then we'll wrap up. Uh, funding is very interesting because it is completely different at the different stages of your company's life cycle, whether you're early stage or whether you're growth or later stage. But um, my personal philosophy is that if you focus on building a process-oriented company, uh, regardless of what your project is, regardless of how the science turns out, you'll always be creating value. You'll always have the opportunity to pivot. Um, and investors, I believe, will see the value in the processes that you've created and continue to support you. Um, the, there are these two phases of fundraising, however, the idea that you can have a very early stage startup and you can also have maturation and growth uh, stage companies. And these are two completely different games. And most of the companies that I see get smacked when they try to make this transition. We did as well. Um, and I also think that this is gonna be a very challenging point for all companies in the aging space specifically. Early stage startup, these are angel investors that think you or your idea are really awesome. There's typically very little diligence done. It's, do I like this person? Do I like what they're trying to do? And it doesn't make sense to do a ton of diligence if the check sizes are relatively small. Usually on the order of maybe that 500K to 2 million. And what we're seeing in the aging space is there's no shortage of companies that are able to close these levels of funding and start doing proof of concept things and everyone gets excited about them. The problem is when you hit this maturation and growth stage and you need to uh, start chatting with sophisticated investors, you need to start getting that $5 million check, the $10 million check and so on. 
these are folks that know their industries really, really well. They know the nuances and challenges of building therapeutics. They do extensive diligence and they know how to ask a lot of hard questions that early stage companies might not be well prepared to answer. And their biggest question is, is this a business? Uh, every startup company ubiquitously says the same thing. We've got this really cool preclinical asset and we're gonna do this stuff with it. And then something about we're going to go through IND enabling studies, meet with FDA, and then clinical trials. And they don't have any people on their team that know any of that. There's been no discussion or consideration of any of that. Uh, they've never heard of you know, CMC and formulation work and how that plays into actually designing the drug, which is sometimes as important or more important than the API itself. They don't have a thought about, oh, we'll do an orphan drug. That's the default. We'll do an orphan drug because small patient and we'll get accelerated approvals. Um, but they don't have the insights about, well, only 50 people in the world have this disease. So how are we going to get them together to run a clinical trial? Uh, these sorts of details are frequently left out. And that's where a lot of these startup companies get smacked when they start running up to those questions and start pretending to have answers to them. So the startup stage um, is relatively straightforward, but I do have a few observations I've made about this stage. One, I have never actually convinced anyone to invest in me, uh, ever. I have only successfully found people who are already looking to invest in a thing that I am already doing. So when a lot of people are thinking about startup funding, they're thinking about Shark Tank where you go on and you pitch the panel and then you convince them that you have this brilliant business idea. But at least in my experience, I haven't found that to be true. Um, you guys are all working on really cool stuff in your own respective domains. There are people that want to fund the cool stuff that you're working on. So it's a game of connecting with those people and building relationships with them rather than convincing someone uh, that what you have is awesome. So it's an it's a experience of finding people. And this is why when I communicate with people, I never go and say, hey, do you want to invest in this? Um, what I actually am interested in is, hey, I have this thing. I'm going to do it. Uh, is this a good fit for you? And if not, do you know anyone that this might be a good fit for? And when you communicate that way, it's kind of nice. You never actually get a no. You're always relationship building. But then what you're really doing is exploring different investors to find someone that's a good fit for you, your project, and your company. And frankly, I think that's a much better relationship than convincing someone to do something that they're not already enthusiastic about. Um, five do nots. These are a little controversial. This is just my opinion. Um, I find early stage, everyone's worried about people stealing their ideas. Um, my general rule of thumb, others will advise you differently, but my rule of thumb uh, people that have the resources and capability of stealing your ideas have their own already and would rather fund you and support you in developing your own. And the people who would steal your ideas aren't capable of doing it. Just my observation. Uh, early stage grants are awesome and if you're at a university already and you can bridge the grant thing, it can be a really good opportunity for non-dilutive funding. Um, I personally, uh, We've won some grants, but we don't do a lot of work with grants just because the timelines associated with getting grant funding can be really, really long if you're a super uh, lean startup company that really needs to go quickly. Um, I personally haven't found a lot of value in startup competitions, though again, I'm based in central New York, so perhaps if you're in Boston or Silicon Valley, those could be more useful. Um, but I, you're either building a company or you're playing a game. I view startup competitions as playing a game and not building a company, though many would disagree with that sentiment. Um, I also don't believe that any entrepreneur should pay for advice at the seed stage. As you get further along, absolutely, you need your consultants that can advise you on stuff. Um, I have never worked with a, uh, a seed company that I've taken, a seed stage company that I've taken money for and telling my investors, hey, I've done technical diligence on these guys, I'm helping them out, this is super interesting, you should take a look at that. That is all the value that I need to justify myself to my investors. So for me to take a piece of your round or compensation, there is this idea of predatory advising. I saw this a lot when I worked in Silicon Valley, people claiming to have these deep networks that give me 10% of your company and a percentage of the raise and you know, I'll connect you with the right people and stay away from that. 
And then I also uh, wouldn't get too bent on valuation. Um, fair valuations are important, and I do see a lot of people um, that aren't willing to take any dilutive hit or think their idea is worth you know, $50 million, not realizing how difficult the development steps are to move it to the next level. Um, so we've been uh, pretty conservative, I think, with the valuations that we've done at our companies. Um, in terms of when I actually do diligence, we've got a lot of investors that uh, have us do diligence on different companies. So just things that I look for personally that are kind of my sticking points. Um, the first thing I look for is, is the founder all in? Um, I like to think a lot of the reason that we were able to uh, enjoy early success with our company is it was very clear we were all in. Investor asked me, he said, uh, how do I know that you're all in? I'm like, well, I dropped out of medical school with $100,000 in debt, uh, building a company on my living room, taking a salary of $30,000 a year. So I'm pretty all in. And that's compelling. Uh, whereas, you know, is it a tenure track faculty member that's kind of doing this company on the side to generate, uh, to bring in cash to fund their own research at the university? Those are two very different stories. Um, and an investor, I think, should prefer a, uh, a company that's, you know, all in, or the founders are all in, or at least one of the founders is all in. Um, also technical hurdles. Uh, there are obvious technical hurdles with any research program whatsoever. I don't care how good you are and I don't care what you're doing. Um, so they exist. So the real question is how does the entrepreneur communicate about what those technical hurdles are? Is the entrepreneur going to pretend, oh, it's not a big deal at all. It's, you know, this isn't a thing. Or, or are they going to say, I don't know about this thing, but we should look at that. Or are they going to say, uh, yep, this is a known issue. Here's how we intend to approach the issue. And then here's how we're going to create pivot options opportunities to work our way around it. Um, no company is going to have perfect diligence, but if the entrepreneurs are very upfront and direct about where the shortcomings and the hurdles are, um, I feel that they're going to be upfront and forthcoming about development hurdles that arise as the program progresses and it creates a more collaborative uh, um, interaction and I think that that's important. And then finally, uh, back to the clinical and development stuff, um, does the founder pretend to know things? Um, this is a great story. So when we were looking, uh, when we left the living room and we were looking for our first uh, building to go to, um, a real estate agent who we decided not to work with uh, brought us to this property that had a tilted um, retaining wall. And uh, my father, who was a contractor, was going through the building with us. And he said, oh, well, what about the retaining wall? And she's like, oh, it's not leaning. It's uh, an optical illusion because it's a curved driveway. Uh, my father, being my father, went and grabbed the level from his truck, put it against there, and said, you tell me that this is not level. I don't approach diligence, and I don't approach relationships, and I definitely don't approach salespeople in the same way. I take a very different approach, and that is, interesting, tell me more. Um, so what I like to do when I'm doing diligence on people is I will try to find something that I know something about and then I'll just ask questions and they're going to keep giving me answers. And because we're in a territory that I know something about, even if they tell me something that I think is completely ridiculous or I know it to be factually incorrect, I'll let them take me down that rabbit hole as far as, I wanna go, as, far as they want to go. It is possible for someone to be really, really good and have one fact or a couple facts you know, misconstrued or an idea misconstrued, but if they pull you down a complete rabbit hole full of absolute BS, they're comfortable doing that and they're trying to portray that as being you know, confident and knowing what they're talking about, that's someone that you don't wanna do business with. Unlike my father who pulls out the level and actually calls them on it, I won't call them on it, I, let, I, I see how far they want to take me on that conversation. And if they you know, are blatantly ignorant and lie to me about their, quality, their understanding of things that I am you know, very certain about, then that leads me to question um, all of those things with stuff that I don't know about and I can't really trust the person. So I found that to be a really effective uh, way of evaluating entrepreneurs as well as evaluating salespeople. Um, so that's all kind of like the really early stage stuff. As we move into the growth stage, um, the, the hard pivot to sophisticated diligence, I think, is where a lot of companies really choke up. Again, this is where we're switching from a couple million dollars to that five to ten million dollar round. And one of the things that I always thought was that I have to explain to the investor or the diligence people or whatever, everything I know, and show them I've got this whole thing handled and just drown them with all of my immense knowledge. Um, and that's not really what it's about. 
Uh, the goal is really to show them that you've thought about the issues, that you have depth, and that um, you, you are sufficiently knowledgeable that you've got it covered and they can trust you with figuring out the programs. Because after all, the investors aren't building the programs, you are. Uh, so the game's about trans and not about transferring all you know, it's about transferring enough that they know you've got the bases covered. I found uh, uh, the uh, rough estimate, but if I give a, a particular talk or I talk about a new program about 10 times, I get about 95% of the questions I'm ever going to be asked about the program. Um, and so what that actually means is you give your presentation 10 times and you know where the holes are and you know where to focus your efforts to improve your plan, to improve your story. Um, and so giving lots of practice pitches, um, excuse me, I think is really uh, important. Uh, back to the previous slide, uh, real knows real, um, so be genuine, don't BS people about stuff you don't know. If you're not certain about things, communicate that and be transparent about that. I think that's really important. Uh, and then finally, communicate depth of knowledge by having depth of knowledge. Um, the advisors and people that I've built the company with, I'm very keen on not only do they uh, help me make the right decisions, but they must be strong educators. They have to teach me why they're doing what they're, or why we should be doing what they're suggesting so that I can make the exact same kinds of decisions. So learning about, you know, clinical trial considerations, learning about accounting standards, everything from legal to accounting to clinical to preclinical, um, you know, nothing can be a black box. Um, last thing on this point, um, is the idea of investor expectations. So anyone that's worked in an actual lab before uh, appreciates that you go uh, actual and green, you go a long period of time with no progress and then all of a sudden everything works and then you move on to your next project. Um, this is pretty inconsistent with how most people view the world where investors are really expecting to have a nice wise you know, step function of increased progress over time uh, as resources are distributed to you. There's kind of two strategies for handling this that I've seen. Um, one is that you can share the actual. Uh, so I'm very transparent with our investors when we're in this period. And uh, without fail, I'd say about 75% of our investors get really cranky with me about here. And then this happens and then i is awesome again. Um, once you've gone through this with a new investor once, they understand this you have that rapport and I think it creates a much more genuine and meaningful relationship. I have also seen the opposite uh, used by a lot of entrepreneurs where they'll have a bunch of previous success that they haven't told anyone about and they leak it predictably over time to show incremental continuous progress. That's another strategy. I think it's a little bit less genuine, but it's highly effective. Uh, so choose your poison on that. Um, three foundational principles and then we're done. Uh, I was reflecting a little bit on what I thought as an entrepreneur were some of the most important things that have allowed the company to be built. Uh, one, be helpful to others. Um, we had a startup company uh, in Syracuse called Finger Lakes Bio. They had developed a technology for making difficult to express proteins and um, I got in contact with them. I thought their stuff was super interesting and I was like, hey, you guys, this is super cool. Let's get it funded. I reached out to one of our investors. I said, he was a tech investor. And I was like, this is going to be really complicated. It's a bunch of protein stuff that you won't find interesting, but I promise you want to write these guys a $100,000 check to develop this thing. So he sent them the check and they didn't have wet lab spaces. So I said, just come on in. You know, you can help me on some stuff. I'll help you on stuff. I'm not going to charge you rent or anything. Just go nuts. And they did that. Uh, we ended up uh, absorbing that company and off of that technology, uh, we've launched three portfolio companies and raised over $12 million. Um, and that's something uh, just for that one tech. And that's something that just would not have been possible if we went tick for tack where I'm asking them to consult for me on projects and paying them and then they're paying rent and all of that. So I found that just trying to be genuine and helpful with people um, really pays dividends and allows you to build a nice reputation and move projects forward quickly. Uh, back to the point about nothing being a black box, uh, I only recruit teachers. Um, if you are the most brilliant person in your space, you're useless to me unless you can teach me to think as you do. And I'd like to think that one of the things that's allowed i to be very successful is this is a cultural mentality at our entire company where everyone is cross-training, everyone is sharing why, and it allows us to really get to um, the best endpoints for everyone at the company. 
And then finally, you know, we started with pretty humble origins in the living room with, you know, a couple bucks. And I remember freaking out the first check that I got in the mail for, uh, for, for starting the company. Um, and now we burn that every two weeks. Um, but as we've grown, um, I, I was thinking about this a lot, which is that even now, um, you still know nothing. And life sciences is incredibly difficult. And one of the biggest problems that I'm combating right now is I still know nothing. And the more funding we raise, the more programs we have, the more publications, the more I think I know something. So as you guys build your own programs and you move from this early stage seed level to having growth stage and more sophisticated companies, um, you know, try to keep that humble element, try to keep learning and realize that this is a really challenging game that we're all in. And if you can continue to improve your skills and uh, remember that you know nothing, I think your companies will be a lot more successful for that. Um, with that said, I really appreciate your uh, attention for three hours. That was a, a bit of a whirlwind. Um, thank you. Um, like I said, I, I did put this whole workshop together because this is what I wish I know uh, I knowed, I knew uh, when I kind of started this whole path. Um, I genuinely value this being a useful experience for you guys. You all paid great money to be here, donated to LEAF, but still we really appreciate it. Um, my contact information is on here, and if you guys feel like reaching out um, to let me know what you hated, what you loved, what you thought was useful, what you think I could cut. Um, can we get the slides? Yes. Uh, if you contact me, we can get the slides. I don't know if uh, Leaf is going to be distributing them, but you can reach out to me and I'll provide them. Um, because I, I, I really want to make this as helpful as possible for everyone that's trying to cure my aging as well. So. Um. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely not. Uh, questions? Yes.